appropriate on the motion. Minister. This budget was constructed in unprecedented circumstances. The restoration of the Executive in January and the Chancellor's budget on the 11th of March meant there was a limited period in which to develop this budget. In addition, the budget has been overshadowed by the outbreak of COVID-19. In his budget on the 11th of March, the Chancellor announced initial measures in response to the economic disruption caused by COVID-19. The allocations arising from these measures were included in the statement I provided to the Assembly on the 16th of March 2020. Since then, the British Government has made further announcements on funding for the response to COVID-19, and while some of the measures apply here, the Executive receives Barnet consequences on any funding provided for England only. Legislation prevented me from including further COVID-19 funding in the budget subsequently laid on 31 March. However, the Executive has taken the COVID-19 response forward separately. While the budget outcome does not reflect the full COVID-19 funding, the budget document does contain details of how departments are responding to the challenges presented by the pandemic. It also outlines the measures which have received additional funding so far. The Executive has allocated funding to support businesses, to maintain public services, including our health service, and to protect the vulnerable. Although our block grant has still not been restored to its pre-austerity levels in real terms, the Executive has been able to support businesses and households. Domestic regional rates, which are already relatively low, have been frozen. The non-domestic regional rate has been reduced by 4p in the pound, which, combined with the reval, will see average bills fall by 18%. A three-month rates holiday has been provided to all businesses to help them cope with the lockdown. All departments have received real-term increases. The Executive has prioritised our key services with the non-ring-fenced resource budget for health, breaking £6 billion for the first time and education be given an 11 per cent increase from its baseline. The Budget will also see £1.6 billion allocated to capital investment. Ministers have been given flexibility to reallocate the resources so they can respond to the new challenges created by COVID-19. This Budget is presented in very difficult circumstances, but it offers a platform to support businesses, maintain public services and protect the vulnerable during this crisis. And I commend the Budget to the Assembly. I now call on the Chair of the Finance Committee, Steve Aiken. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, as the Minister has outlined, the motion before us today seeks the approval of the Assembly for the expenditure proposals contained in the Budget laid on 31 March of this year and the supporting information laid last week. As we are acutely aware, the resumption of routine Assembly business has taken a significant detour while we understand and react to the impacts on our society caused by the devastating pandemic and the significant challenges that we all face to mitigate them. The events leading up to the collapse of the Executive in 2016 are well rehearsed, and I do not intend to revisit these today. However, they have provided the necessary catalyst to change how we meet our responsibilities as elected representatives to scrutinise the Executive. Due to circumstances relating to both the timing of the Executive's return and the impacts of the COVID-19 outbreak, this budget process has been far from ideal. However, it was necessary in order to try and get us back into a normal budgetary cycle. For this budget cycle, the Committee for Finance has revised the usual methodology to help facilitate a more consistent, coordinated and productive approach to gathering budgetary information from departments. A key aspect of this work was the introduction of a standardised template developed in, con in conjunction with the Assembly's Research and Information Service to provide a reliable baseline of evidence to assist all Assembly committees and the Committee for Finance to deliver a more consistent approach on how information is sought from departments and presented to committees. I'd like to convey my special thanks to RAE's researchers for their invaluable contribution to developing this approach and for the analysis of the departmental responses under what are considerable and significant time constraints. I would also want to put on record my thanks to all committees in adhering to the time frame set by the Committee for Finance to coordinate and contribute to today's business. Turning to the Department of Finance, the Committee considered evidence at its meeting on the 22nd of April in respect to the Department's own requirements. Although the Department of Finance has smaller resource requirements compared to others, its function fulfils a critical role in coordinating expenditure across government departments. It has been difficult for all committees to fully scrutinise their departments' budgets due to, first of all, the condensed process for budget scrutiny resulting from the Assembly returning to normal business 
shortly before the deadline for the Budget Bill, restrictions imposed on committees and departments as a result of COVID, and the consistently changing financial position resulting from funding measures put in place in response to the pandemic. Despite these difficulties, the approach adopted by the Committee for Finance has supported the Committee to circumvent many of the barriers and find a way to undertake its scrutiny function at departmental levels. The Committee raised a number of issues with the Department in relation to the departmental budget. These included issues regarding departmental pressures relating to rates and pay, how IT costs are classified as either resource Dell or capital Dell, provisions made for potential slippage in the delivery of projects, departmental borrowing and funding relating to Brexit. The Department raised a timely response to the issues raised, and this was considered and approved by the Committee at last week's meeting. The Committee is therefore satisfied that it has had the appropriate opportunity to adequately scrutinise the Department of Finance's budget. Mr Deputy Speaker, moving on to the Executive Budget in the Minister's statement on 31 March, there was a funding provision of $120 million specifically in response to COVID-19. There have been further measures subsequently announced by our Chancellor of the Exchequer as the situation has developed and the impact of the pandemic on health and the economy has become regrettably clearer. The Department of Finance has also led a budget document that includes details of further COVID-19 funding, bringing the total provision to $1.19 billion, which has been provided quite remarkably in less than four weeks for a national exchequer. The Committee's focus to date in relation to the allocation of this funding has been on scrutinising the procurement of personal protective equipment for our frontline workers and volunteers. It has also focused on how resources are being used to support the economy and employment, mainly through non-domestic rates measures. Appropriate resource allocation to health and the economy and the response to COVID-19 are critical if we are to fight the virus, reduce its spread and mitigate the long-term impacts of our economy. It is also essential that there is sufficient and timely preparation to respond and revitalise our economy once we start to emerge from the lockdown and start to rebuild our economy and our society. The Committee considered the Minister's announcement that he intends needing to bring forward a further vote on account aimed at preventing COVID-19 departmental spending from exceeding limits contained in the recently, as have been recently passed in the Budget Act. Having received notification from the Department on Friday, the 24th of April, that in the absence of a further vote on account and budget bill, there is a risk that departments will exceed their authorised spending limits. Our committee then broadened the scope of its oral evidence session last week to receive evidence and question officials on this matter. Officials confirmed that departments most at risk of exceeding those limits are, not surprisingly, the Department of Economies, Health and Communities, but also Education and Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. Officials are also, also explained that it is likely that some departments will need to, need to access in excess of their indicated budget allocation because payments are being front-loaded in order to support the requirements of our recovering economy. It is important to note that the Committee received assurances that, in such incidents, these totals would not exceed the combined totals contained in the Budget and the coronavirus-related allocations. The budget, alloc the budget cycle is an ongoing process which is currently being implemented in an ever-changing environment. Given the current circumstances, the Committee is content with the programme that is being made to date. The Committee will continue to scrutinise the Budget position as it develops and will expect the Department of Finance to be proactive in including the Committee in regular ongoing consultation. The Committee will, of course, consider the additional Budget Bill in detail when it is presented to the Committee. The Committee will expect to be appropriately consulted on the Bill prior to considering it if its content to grant accelerated passage in line with provisions under Standing Order 42.2. The current circumstances underline the need for timely and relevant information and engagement with Assembly Committees at all stages and particularly during the in-year monitoring process. June monitoring will be the first opportunity committees have to formally scrutinise how departments and the executive spending plans are being implemented. I encourage all committees to make the most of this opportunity. Mr Deputy Speaker, as we look to the future, we will need to consider how we plan for and shape our recovery from the devastating economic effects of the pandemic. It is crucial that we put the appropriate support in place to breathe new life into our economy. 
At last, at last week's meeting, the committee questioned officials on how plans for recovery are being taken forward. It was encouraging to hear that public spending directive is part of the group which has been established in the Department for the Economy to look at just this issue. Although it is at an early stage, the committee will view progress in that group with interest. And in that regard, I have written to the chairperson of the Committee for the Economy to consider how our two committees together, together can work on this important cross-cutting matter. Mr. Speaker, on behalf of the Committee of Finance, I support the motion. And I'd like to make some remarks as very short remarks, you'd be glad to hear, as a finance speaking for the Ulster Unionist Party. I think that only the most narrow-minded politicians would query the efforts of the government in London to provide necessary resources during this crisis. However, where legitimate questions do arise is in the speed and overall response of some executive departments to pass on resource and support to our business community, our disadvantaged, our unemployed, our transport infrastructure and our third sector. Many, Mr Minister, in this House will have dealt with complaints and quite justifiable concerns that our citizens are not being as equitably treated as those in the rest of the United Kingdom. In a budgetary context, much of the resource to require to sustain our people is there. What is lacking is any strategy or any evidence of a longer-term plan, plans that have already been outlined in Scotland, Wales, by our Prime Minister and his five points, and even by our close neighbours in Dublin. The UUP has called time and again for a recovery plan to be created, a plan that involves all the key stakeholders. We have even asked that the new decade, new approach programme for government be refocused to COVID recovery. Now is the time for all parties to join us and show leadership in delivering for all of the people of Northern Ireland. Mr Deputy Speaker, on behalf of the UUP, we also support the motion on Budget 2021. Thank you. I now call on the Communities Committee Chair, Paula Bradley. Mr Deputy Speaker, can I also pass all my condolences um, to John Dallet's family at this very sad time. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Committee for Communities was braced, briefed by department officials on the department's budget position on the 22nd of April. Firstly, can I say the committee acknowledges the extremely difficult circumstances in which the department has compiled the budget, given the funding requirements for COVID-19 actions to date and the uncertainty the crisis has presented. The headline resource Dell budget for 2020-21 is $824 million. The committee noted that while specific budget allocations have been made, these are subject to change depending on the minister's priorities and the evolving impact of COVID-19 position. What was most striking about the briefing was the uncertainty regarding any funding specifics beyond quarter one and the generally heavily caveated nature of the estimates provided to the committee. The COVID-19 budget requirements for quarter one alone total almost 61 million with a projected requirement of just over 49 million per quarter for the remaining three quarters. Of course, the committee recognises that recent priori priorities have all been COVID-19 related and the committee has supported the minister in her initiatives to support those people impacted as a result of the crisis. We also note that each of these initiatives has generally come with a significant price tag. I'm sure that many here will have heard from their party's local councillors about the pressures council councils are under. The reduction in revenue of local councils is not sustainable for much longer. We heard just last week of at least one council planning redundancies, and there had been conflicting analysis of whether councils could place staff on the government's furlough scheme. I note that last night the Minister for Communities confirmed that council workers could apply for the furlough scheme. That will come as welcome relief to many councils. But it still does not solve the significant financial pressures that councils are under as a result of COVID-19. The Department has sought £16.5 million for councils in quarter one and in subsequent quarters, but over the medium term this is unlikely to be enough to enable councils to continue to deliver the services that ratepayers expect. The Committee is scheduled to hear from Solace next week, and hopefully the financial position of councils will be made clear. But perhaps the Minister could say a few words about the likelihood of additional funding in the coming months for councils. The committee was told and is also concerned that if more funding for COVID-19 is not forthcoming, then the department will be under pressure to find these requirements from its existing budget. What is also concerning is that the department envisages additional funding demands as a result of the new decade new approach and the potential impact of EU exit. 
Officials noted that on these two issues there was significant uncertainty around requirements and funding available. With uncertainty being the prevailing theme of our briefing, it is likely that the figures we discussed a couple of weeks ago with officials will be unrecognisable in the coming weeks. Some funding issues, though, have been agreed. The extension of some of the welfare mitigation members, measures agreed as part of the NDNA agreement have, co have a cost of £41.7 million for 2020-21, and the Department <coughs> was allocated £40.3 million to meet these mitigation measures, over half of which going towards the social sector size criteria. At any other time, we would be discussing in detail how we continue to fund these mitigation measures beyond 2021, a difficult enough decision to reach in normal times, given the range of other competing priorities and financial limitations. But now, as a result of COVID-19, we will have many more people claiming universal credit who will not have had the same protections as those already on benefits when these mitigation measures were introduced. That presents us with an increasing moral dilemma of possibly a two-tier benefit system. Clearly, we need agreement on what a sustainable and stable benefit system should look like. The current circumstances have clearly made what we might consider normal prioritising and budgeting something of a movable feast. The committee was advised that officials would be working to finalise figures over the coming weeks, meaning that the June monitoring round was likely to be the more informative point in the budgetary cycle rather than anything we might hear this week. The flexibility afforded to ministers to reallocate internal funding as part of the June monitoring round is important. It is perhaps more important than ever given that there is likely to be very little money to be surrendered to the centre for redistribu redistribution in any case. I also note that this flexibility is to be kept under review by the executive and may be extended if necessary. I think the committee would certainly support flexibility in respect of internal reallocation. The committee would urge the Minister for Communities to decide on her prior priorities sooner rather than later and make the appropriate allocation based on strategic way forward. One of the main concerns the committee had was the impact of COVID-19 on capital funding. The committee would, of course, be supportive of a flexible approach as possible to capital funding to ensure that key projects are not put at risk. The committee welcomes the increased bid of £232.25 for new build social homes, which is an increase of £145.86 million from last year and meets the commitment to increase the number of social homes to 3,000 per year uh, as an NDNA. The committee also supports the £55 million bid for financial transactions capital and notes the additional bid for £55 million capital Dell in case the legislation to reclassify registered housing associations back to private entities is in progress in time. The committee will hopefully <coughs> be briefed by the Minister next week on this leg legislation and if its pro progress is agreed with the committee, we would hope that the £55 million FT FTC bid is ultimately successful. The COVID-19 crisis will clearly continue to delay projects and when, for example, housing associations are having to plan for new builds, including buying land, getting planning permission, etc., the possibility they would be able to spend the allocated budget before the end of year is also remote. So looking ahead, the community would like flexibility in extending capital projects. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, to say the budgetary position of the Department of Communities is evolving is to state the obvious. It is clear we will know more when the Minister's priorities are decided. I ask the member to draw remarks to close. Thank you, and we look forward to liaising with the Minister on these matters over the coming months and lending our support. Thank you. I call Sean Lynch. As a member of the Finance Committee, I want to commend the Minister for presenting this budget for, and for the numerous initiatives he has designed to protect our people and mitigate the damage to the economy during these very challenging times. When we first sat as a committee some two months ago, little did anyone know that the budget of 2021 would be overshadowed by an unprecedented public health crisis, a crisis that would impact on all our lives, both socially and e economically. In a statement to the Chamber in March, the Minister said, protecting lives and livelihoods from the pandemic is now the number one priority. In that regard, many members will want to know will help be available 
in our response to the COVID-19 crisis. Since the beginning of March, these priorities have certainly dominated everything we do as elected representatives. The Minister has confirmed in this budget the level of funding allocated to the various departments for the period 2021 and the level of funding available to offset the huge impact of COVID. Separate from the departmental allocation set out in the first section, the COVID-19 response has included funding of $1 billion allocated to maintain public services, support businesses and protect the most vulnerable. I want to commend all ministers for getting the money of this funding out the door as quickly as possible. I know from speaking to many businesses and communities that the assistance has been welcomed. These grants and schemes did not cover any, everyone. This was understandable because of the speed ministers and the executive had to react to the development health crisis and the virtual close down of society. I know the Minister has recognised this and has given an undertaking to look at schemes to try to cover those who have fallen through the net. I want to commend the Minister for Communities for the assistance she has given to the most vulnerable. It is encouraging to witness parcels being delivered to our local communities. The work she has done to include charities, communities and the voluntary sector. Flexibility in relation to grant funding, which means a reduction in bureaucracy on important measures to help and make it easier for communities and voluntary sector. This includes no need for fees and more simple applications for grants. The COVID-19 Community Support Grant funding she announced is also to be welcomed. This fund released $1.5 million initially through local government's existing support programme and Community Foundation's small grants programme to tackle the crisis at local level. Talking to local communities and sports organisations, these programmes have been hugely appreciated in reaching the most vulnerable. Credit also should go to the staff who are making all this happen under difficult circumstances. As I said earlier in the debate on the rates order, as most members will have encountered, is that rates is a huge issue, particularly since the outbreak of COVID. The reduction of 18% in the non-domestic rate and the freezing of the domestic regional rate for the next year will be welcomed by struggling households and businesses during these uh, challenging times. Turning to the budget itself, um, even before the arrival of COVID, this budget was initiated in a very difficult, difficult, different financial context. In real terms, the block grant was some £360 million before pre-austerity levels. Over, the period of the pre over that period, pressure on public services has increased. Indeed, this has been highlighted somewhat in the process to tackle COVID-19. However, despite the pressures, the Minister has been able to deliver a budget that, compared to last year, provide, provides an increase in real terms to all departments. I am encouraged that he has given priority to education and health, which for the first time has been allocated over £6 billion in resource funding. The £1.6 billion of capital that has been allocated to invest in our infrastructure, increase in much needed funding for broadband and support for the construction industry. These allocations will support the economy and hopefully assist in the recovery from the current, current crisis. I also welcome the flexibility that the Minister has given to each department to reprofile their budgets in response to the health emergency, with particular focus on protecting key services, businesses and looking after the most vulnerable. This flexibility is important to allow departments to be agile and to plan for the challenges that arise during this unprecedented period. Finally, in terms of in-year budget, I am aware of the Executive and the Minister are supportive of bringing forward multi-year budgets, which will give greater certainty to public services. In that process, we on the Finance Committee look forward to working with the Minister to ensure this will happen in future budgets. I now call on Colin McGrath, the Executive Office Committee Chair.
Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I hope that as Chairman of the SDLP, you will give me a little latitude for a moment to offer my condolences to our colleague uh, John Dallet and his family at this sad time. John was a representative for East Derry for a generation and a teacher before that, always in a community role, working hard and with a fire in his belly that many of us would be jealous of. I appreciate the remarks that have been made by colleagues here in the House today. I know that his family, his wife Anne, children Helena, Ronan, Dermot, and his eight grandchildren will take great comfort from them. And I appreciate too that we will have an opportunity for a full and proper reflection on John's immense contribution to civic life in Ireland next week. Mr Deputy Speaker, I rise to speak as Chair of the Committee for the Executive Office and welcome the opportunity to participate in the debate and would like to thank the Minister of Finance for bringing it to the House. There is no doubt that these have been unusual challenges around this year's budget. Not only are we dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic that has turned our world upside down uh, and changed beyond recognition the way we work and conduct our lives, but we are still feeling the effect of the three-year absence of a fully functioning government, which has resulted in a compressed budget planning timetable. Despite these circumstances, it is important that committees conduct their scrutiny in as thorough a manner as possible, and we have all endeavoured to do that in these very challenging and unsettling times. As is the case with other statutory committees, the Committee for the Executive Office adopted a standardised committee scrutiny approach to the budget. As part of that approach, it issued a budget template to the Executive Office to capture relevant information on the 1920 financial year, as well as the resource and capital requirements for the 2021 year and the revenue expected. At this point, I would like to put on record the Committee's thanks to the Assembly Research Team for developing the template. It has proved really useful in helping the Committee to look backwards and forwards to get the full financial picture. Departmental officials attended the Committee meeting on the 22nd of April to answer members' questions on the pressures that it identified and the budget allocation made by the Executive. A formal response to the budget was then agreed at the Committee meeting on the 29th of April, and I will now rehearse some of the main points contained in it. The Executive Office received an uplift in budget of over 72 per cent, uh, primarily due to the increase or the inclusion rather, of £37.5 million for the historical institutional abuse payments, and a total of £98 million has been allocated to the Department. But similar to previous times, significant pressures were identified. Uh, there is inescapable pressures totalling £151 million. Pre-committed pressures totaling 33 million, and one high priority pressure of half a million covering departmental running costs. In relation to capital, the department identified uh, inescapable pressures of 10 million, pre-committed pressures of nearly 9 million. The department has also identified 5.2 million of anticipated income, although the committee noted that the majority of that income represents recruitment of existing departmental costs and is therefore required to meet the department's resource pressures. Given the limit time limits of the debate, I do not want to go into every pressure that was identified, but I do want to draw attention to some, including a number that have not received an allocation. A pressure of nearly one million was identified for NDNA programme delivery covering management and preparatory work on language, identity and cultural expression, including progressing legislation and the creation of the relevant bodies. The Executive's budget did not include an allocation for this area. However, the Department will take forward this work using existing baseline resources and will progress legislation and the creation of the relevant bodies as the operation of the Assembly and available resource permit during the current crisis. During the evidence sessions with officials, clarifications were sought on whether the 5.83 million pressure had been identified earlier in the year for the same area was no longer relevant. The committee was advised that the earlier identified amount was a marker bid, as costs for the scheme had not been determined at that stage. The committee noted that, and given the current COVID-19 pandemic, timing around the introduction of the legislation is unclear, and therefore significant expenditure in the 2021 is very unlikely. As I mentioned earlier, the uplift in the Executive Office budget was primarily due to the allocation of funding for the Historical Institutional Abuse Redress Scheme, and it is very much welcomed. All members share the view that the costs should be met centrally from the block grant for the lifetime of the scheme. However, 
There is also a very strongly held view that the robust efforts should be made to secure funds from those institutions who were involved in the abuse. It is important that they take responsibility and share the costs with the public sector. The committee understands that there has been some initial contact between the Executive Office and the institutions, and this is an area the committee will follow up on. The redress scheme has now commenced, and while the committee is very much in favour of increasing the cap on the maximum amounts payable to victims and survivors, it appreciates that the introduction of legislation necessary to do that could cause unwarranted delays in the payments being made to those who have already waited far too long for the redress scheme. I would like to point out very clearly that the committee believes the maximum amounts payable should be more. The victims and survivors deserve more. Turning now to capital, included was 2.3 million pressure for ongoing development of the Ebrington site and 5.2 million pressures for capital programmes within the Urban Villages programme. When asked for certainty around funding for this work, officials assured the committee that there was no threat to the availability of capital funding, and this was very much welcome. There were other pressures identified that did not receive an allocation in the Executive's budget. COVID-19 is one such pressure, and the committee appreciates that the bulk of funding allocated through the Barnett formula to deal with the COVID pandemic is being used to support the health response to the pandemic. Uh, with time pressing on, uh, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, I would maybe like to just mention um, that there is the issue of legacy, and I mentioned this as an uh, individual MLA, that there is a, a bit of concern. The payments to victims of the troubles here has taken too long. As it stands, we have no scheme, and we do not know who will pay for it. These individuals are some of the most deserving in our community, people often going about their day and daily life only to be caught up in an Would incident, and as a result, close? have uh, lifelong injuries. Um, these lives, uh, injuries have changed their lives, and we hope that some scheme can be developed so that they can get the pensions that they so richly deserve. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I call Chris Little, the Chair of the Education Committee. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I begin by responding to the budget debate as Chairperson of the Assembly Education Committee in relation to the budget for the Department of Education, which, as we know, is in financial crisis. The Department of Education previously advised the Education Committee of financial pressures of £427 million pounds for 2020-21. This included £148 million pounds for teachers and non-teachers' pay, £80 million pounds for the Education Authority and £60 million pounds plus for school budgets. Yet the Department of Education has been allocated £227 million, pounds, some £200 million pounds less than the amount requested. Due to COVID-19, some of the expenditure planned by the Department of Education has been paused, but the non-COVID-19 Department of Education resource pressures still exceed the budget 2020-21 allocation by £165 million. Pounds. Education Committee members are particularly alarmed to learn of the increasing annual pay pressure in education, which may conceivably exceed £200 million pounds by 2022-23. This significant financial challenge has, as I have stated clearly on many occasions, uh, demands radical reform and reorganisation of education in Northern Ireland. The consequences of this funding gap for education are severe. But Education Committee members are clear that no cuts as a result of this financial gap should fall on special educational needs provision, mental health and emotional well-being, tackling underachievement linked to deprivation and delivering equal educational opportunity for all. The Assembly Education Committee also reiterates its support for the restoration of modest funding for Book Trust Book Start programme, which is a low-cost, high-impact early years literacy programme. The programme is even more important during social isolation, as whilst reading has thankfully increased for many families, a significant number of children are at risk of inadequate access to resources and learning. Indeed, Book Trust research published on May 1 found that 22 per cent of parents are unable to complete any home education with their children, and 14 per cent are unable to read to or with their children. This surely is an issue to which we, we must respond. The Budget must respond, the Finance Minister and the Education Minister must respond. 
I would encourage any parents or guardians who have internet access and are struggling with reading at home to visit thebooktrust.org.uk forward slash hometime hyphen NI website to access local authors and artists demonstrating reading and drawing activities for families and for links to other valuable programs like Libraries NI Fighting Words. Not everyone has access to the internet, Mr Deputy Speaker, which is why Book Trust Book Start programme is such a worthwhile investment for the Executive and why I am eager to hear what, if any, plans the Executive has to provide internet and computer resources to children and young people in need of them. The Assembly Education Committee welcomes funding for a number of essential COVID-19 measures, such as the free school meal payment and the joint childcare support scheme in partnership between the Education and Health Departments. There are, however, families in Northern Ireland who do not have a bank account and who are not, therefore, in receipt of free school meal payments that they need. The Assembly Education Committee has raised this matter with the Education Minister. The £12 million childcare support scheme is, of course, welcome, but its implementation by the Health and Education Ministers is taking too long and asking too much of our highly valued and dedicated childcare providers. The Joint Department of Education and Department of Health childcare support allocation of £12 million was announced on April the 9th, yet not a penny has reached childcare providers and a childcare sector fighting for survival, a sector which is vital to the development of our children and will be essential for the recovery of our economy. It is particularly concerning, therefore, to learn that Playboard NI surveys suggest that up to 20 per cent of childcare providers are unsure if they will be able to reopen further to the COVID-19 shutdown. The Assembly Education Committee has met with childcare representative bodies such as the Northern Ireland Child Mining Association, Early Years, Playboard, Employers for Child Care, the Northern Ireland Day Care Owners and the Employers Forum for Early Years Playwork and Childminders, and we will do all we can to support the prompt and sensible delivery of the COVID-19 child care support scheme to this key sector. The Assembly Education Committee has also consistently raised the need for urgent delivery of adequate pay for substitute teachers during the, the period of COVID-19 social isolation. And we are increasingly concerned by accounts of significant hardship being experienced by dedicated substitute teachers in our community and expect this matter to be urgently addressed by the Education Minister. Education Committee members also foresee and ask the Executive to support all funding uh, for educational settings to safeguard the well-being and educational development of our children and young people on their return from COVID-19 lockdown. There are some aspects of the Department of Education COVID-19 budget requests for which the Assembly Education Committee members would seek further rationale, such as approximately £4 million funding for preparatory schools and boarding schools. In terms of capital expenditure, the Department of Education has a budget of around £157 million for 2019-20 and £138 million for 2021. Uh, the Assembly Education Committee accepts this as to extent due to the COVID-19 shutdown, but the state of disrepair of much of our school estate must be addressed. Uh, I realise I am running out of time, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, so perhaps the Finance Minister could speak in some uh, clarity with regards to the availability of Fresh Start capital funds, uh, in particular, uh, if there is further clarity on the Fresh Start capital money. Uh, for 2020 uh, I thank the member. I now call Michelle McElveen, the chairperson of the Infrastructure Committee. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I would like to express my condolences to John Dollett's family at this very difficult time. I welcome this opportunity to outline to the Chamber the Committee for Infrastructure's consideration and views in respect of today's debate. I would firstly like to reiterate the size of the deficit facing the Department of Infrastructure prior to the current health crisis before speaking about both the impact of COVID-19 on the Department and the budget allocation being discussed by members today. During the Committee's scrutiny of the Department's finances, the stark situation faced by the Department was made clear. 
The Department informed the Committee in January that its budget has a recurring structural deficit of, a, of £61 million going into 2021, 20, which is to rise to £80 million in 2021-22 and £90 million in 2022-23. While the Department's budget for 2021 has increased by 8.6% to £558 million capital and almost £418 million resource, this amounts to an additional £33 million on last year. The Department has warned that the proposed resource funding increase of £33 million for DFI will have severe implications on critical infrastructure services, not least water and water, wastewater, road maintenance, street lighting, repairs, winter gritting and public transport. The Minister advised that she has yet to decide on the final distribution of allocations for both resource and capital and so only provided the Committee with indicative resource budget allocations. Given that the committee is unable to fully scrutinise the 2021 allocations at this stage, I will outline the pressures facing the department. With respect to water and sewage, it has not been possible to fund Northern Ireland Water to the levels recommended by the utility regulator. This has meant that Northern Ireland Water has been unable to connect new housing developments and businesses to the sewage network and has warned that developments at over 100 locations across Northern Ireland have the potential to stagnate. Officials told the committee that prior to the 14-15 departmental budget uh, reductions, the department would have regularly allocated some 35 million to cover routine maintenance and meet winter requirements. In recent years, this budget has been cut to less than half. The capital budget for 1920 was 471 million. The requirement for 2021 is 795 million, increasing to 1.4 billion by 22-23. Officials outlined that it prioritises funding for flagship projects such as the major road upgrades and that these are inescapables. The utility regulator's determination on Northern Ireland water funding is inescapable. There's a contract in place to buy new carriages for the rail network and procurement for new buses. Funding for Waterways Ireland and the design phase of York Street and the deficit to TransLink have also to be found. The Living with Water programme requires £1.45 billion capital budget over the next decade. On the roads network, the recent Barton and NIAO reports on structural maintenance of the roads network recommend that the Department for Finance and Department for Infrastructure work to get towards ensuring funding of some £143 million per annum on a recurring basis to prevent further deterioration. Mr Deputy Speaker, I have left the most notable shortfall to last and it's a matter of TransLink and the very real possibility that it could become insolvent. As has been well rehearsed, TransLink has had a reduced budget of around £13 million per year and ran its service at a deficit and used its reserves to supplement this. The £19 million requested for TransLink in the monitoring round was unsuccessful. Their reserves next year will be well below the level of working capital that it needs and may cease to be deemed as a going concern which, I suppose in many respects, is all academic now given that as a result of the current crisis, TransLink's revenue streams have dried up due to the lockdown and social distancing. The committee is aware that there is a COVID fund to mitigate, mitigate these challenges, yet the committee as yet has had to write to the Finance Minister for clarity on why the Department for Infrastructure is the only department not to have received money from this fund. The Minister acknowledged this when she came before the committee last week. At that briefing, the Minister noted that her Department's estimate of COVID-19 related pressures was up to £181 million. 90 to £114 million um, costs are estimated to come from the loss of revenue to TransLink. The Committee has been, re has been assured that a cast ga iron guarantee has been given to cover this loss and protect public transport. To hear that from, directly from the Minister today would be welcome, along with his view in the discussions with DFI on furloughing TransLink staff. Turning to Northern Ireland Water, it relies on the income it receives from businesses to provide its essential service, and due to the closure of many businesses, the estimate of pressure on Northern Ireland Water's finances is now between £17.5 million and £32 million. Pounds. The committee was advised that if this revenue stream is not covered, it will render Northern Ireland Water unable to sustain the essential public services and put at risk their ability to provide clean, safe drinking water critical for public health and effectively treat wastewater to protect the environment. DVA is primarily funded through um, fees and the cessation of most services provided by DVA has resulted in little to no fee income being collected. However, significant costs continue to be incurred. The department has estimated that lost revenue 
for three months is 8.6 million, increasing to 19.4 million for six months and 30.7 million for nine months. The Department has also warned that if funding for this loss of revenue is not secured, there will be an inability to continue paying fixed costs such as staff costs and the trading fund status of DVA may not be sustainable. This is a grim picture and has not, been, not even included the funding that we were required to meet the Department's obligations under the new decade, new approach. And while we welcome the Executive's announcement yesterday for additional money towards the city deals and associated infrastructure projects, it's imperative that additional money is found to kickstart the economy with investment being prioritised for key capital infrastructure programmes. The Committee for Infrastructure will continue its scrutiny of the Department for Infrastructure budget as we move through this process. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I now call on Kiva Archibald, the Chair of the uh, Economy Committee. Agora Margaret, Les Concordia, um, and I too would like to extend my deepest condolences to the family, friends and colleagues of my constituency colleague, John Dallet. Um, I rise to speak today as Chair of the Economy Committee, um, and it really doesn't seem that long since um, I last rose to speak in the Chamber on the second stage of the Budget Bill in February, and yet so much has changed since then. None of us could have imagined then the situation that we now find ourselves in. The COVID-19 pandemic and crisis has changed all our lives in so many ways. This pandemic is the extraordinary backdrop against which we discuss the 2020-21 budget today. Last can call you. I am sure the Finance Minister, other members present and committee chairs contributing to this debate will acknowledge that the current crisis has had a large impact on this budget process. The Economy Committee and I expect most other um, statutory committees will not really have been able to apply the level of scrutiny to this budget that they normally would at this stage. I know that some members of my committee have expressed frustration that the Department's budget has been a moving target. The allocations made in the latest budget document are likely to be subject to an unknown level of change, which hinders scrutiny. We do not know how long this situation will last, and as a consequence, it is difficult to assess how many of the Economy Department's budget allocations can and will be utilised for their original purpose. It will be some months before there is truly a clear picture of the impact that the COVID-19 crisis and the subsequent executive response is having on the 2020-21 budget. Last can call you. In their briefing to the Economy Committee, officials indicated that there may well be elements of the departmental budget and those of its ALBs that can be repurposed for the COVID-19 response, again making scrutiny at this point difficult. The Committee is very supportive of the Department's COVID-19 response to date and is advising the Department on gaps in schemes and other issues through extensive consultation with its stakeholder network. The Committee cannot make a definitive judgment on the Department for the Economy's 2020-21 budget plans at this stage because of the issues outlined above. However, members stand ready to scrutinise the Department's budget as and when there is greater detail and certainty. The Committee has already raised the issue of the need for sign-off on the Graduate Medical School at McGee project before the end of May, as per the General Medical Council's requirement for the academic year, uh, opening on the academic year 2021. And members support the required funding made available by the executive once the project receives timely sign-off. As a key driver of the COVID-19 response, the Department for the Economy must have its budgetary needs prioritised. The committee looks forward to the outcome of the June monitoring round to better assess where the department budget position sits. The committee has concerns about the other work that is a vital part of the department's remit the response to Brexit and the impact of the protocol, dealing with the RHI inquiry response, as well as strategies across a range of policy areas, including energy, tourism, further and higher education, skills and others. Additionally, the Department has a number of actions coming from New Decade, New Approach. Last can call you, while it is not possible at this point to make definitive statements or scrutiny points on the Department's budget, the Committee remains ready to offer advice and guidance to the Minister in the challenging days ahead. Members are cognizant of the fact that considerable resources will be needed to get the economy back on its feet again and begin to build our recovery. The Committee is united in its view at, that at present this is first and foremost a health crisis and the budget must be deployed appropriately in response. For now, the Economy Committee is um, forced to reserve its position as this is not a normal budget process. Last can call you, I will now make some remarks in my capacity as Sinn Féin Economy Spokesperson in support of the motion. The current priority for all of us is dealing with the COVID-19 and its impact. The restrictions that have been put in place have severe economic consequences, but they have been necessary to save as many lives as possible. 
As we plan for the recovery, that remains our aim to save lives. We need a phased return to business that keeps the spread of the virus under control, because lifting restrictions too quickly and allowing the virus to spread could lead to further lockdowns, which would cause even greater economic damage. The £510 million that the Finance Minister has directed towards supporting businesses to mitigate against the impact of COVID-19 so far has been most welcome. £370 million for grant schemes, £100 million to date for the rates holiday, and a further £40 million towards a hardship scheme to support those who have missed out from other support, and that we hope will be announced soon, along with support for the others who have not yet received any funding. The growth deals and city deals funding announced yesterday for regions across the north are also very welcome, and I thank the Minister for his work on those. They will be very important in the years ahead. However, I think we all recognise there will be a need for further targeted support and the British Government will have to invest further to support the economic recovery. As we look forward to planning for the recovery, there needs to be debate and discussion about the type of economy and society we want coming out of the pandemic, an economy that recognises the vital role of the healthcare and other key workers that have stepped up to the plate to ensure essential services continue to be delivered. Many in roles that the British Home Secretary deemed unskilled not that long ago. An economy that upholds workers' rights, where zero hour contracts and bogus self employment are things of the past, where agency workers enjoy the same rights as other employees. An economy that encourages entrepreneurship and where businesses can thrive. An economy with decarbonisation as a core tenet, which harnesses the potential of our natural resources through a Green New Deal. Prior to this pandemic, we had thriving hospitality, tourism, manufacturing and many other sectors. We had social enterprises and cooperatives doing brilliant work in communities. They will need to have support and guidance to return to doing what they do best. Around us, while some sectors have ground to a halt, others have had to expand rapidly to support new working arrangements, the digital economy, cyber security, delivery services. In planning for the recovery, we should seek to develop those sectors that have high-value growth potential further. This will require investing in digital infrastructure, skills development and innovation through research funding, but will have great benefits. For the second time in little over a decade, an economic crisis is likely to result in high levels of youth unemployment. We need to be prepared to respond to this and ensure young people have alternative pathways to develop their skills or learn on the job in new industries. An all-island approach to the recovery is the only sensible option, coordinating the response, benefiting from our interconnected Would supply chains and building on our strength just makes sense. The challenge facing us is great, but our response must be one that tackles inequality and builds resilience to future pandemics like this one. I now call Paul Given, Chair of the Justice Committee. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the opportunity to speak as Chairman of the Justice Committee in this uh, debate today. The budget announced by the Minister of Finance on the 31st of March included allocations of 1,111.2 million resource Dale and 88.1 million capital uh, for the Department of Justice. The budget document uh, noted that this was an increase of 6.3% on the 2019-20 resource Dell allocation. However, uh, the Department has advised that this includes funding for a number of matters, such as £5 million pounds of uh, ring fence funding for legacy pressures and PSNI security funding. And when you remove such costs and compare like with like, it equates to an increase of just 2.5% on the 2019-20 resource Dell. The Department has advised that the allocation is not adequate to maintain current services, and the Minister of Justice has raised her concerns with the Finance Minister. Uh, overall, staff costs account for over two-thirds of the Department's uh, resource expenditure. The major portion of resource funding, uh, 72 per cent, is allocated to its uh, NDPBs, and that includes the Police Service, which alone will receive over £785 million, including uh, security funding. The Department's agencies account for 23 per cent of expenditure, whilst 5 per cent will be allocated to the core department. The police service will also receive the highest capital allocation of nearly £60 million, while the prison service has been allocated just under £17 million, and the court service will receive nearly £7 million. In terms of the COVID-19, the Committee was mindful that the Department's planning took place before the COVID-19 crisis materialised. Members recognise that the pandemic is likely to have a significant impact 
on the delivery of services across the justice sector, which may not uh, yet be fully realised for some time. The committee also understands that there is regular engagement with the Department of Finance on COVID-19 related costs. The Department of Justice had earlier indicated costs in the region of $38.8 million, receiving allocations of $4 million for the police service and $1.9 million for the prison service. It is the Committee's view Mr. Deputy Speaker, that there will be programmes and projects that have been planned before this crisis began to unfold that will now not be able to continue or be initiated as anticipated. This could free up resources for reallocation to meet urgent COVID-19 resource requirements. The bid submitted to the Department of Finance appears to have been made without evaluating or taking account of the likely, likely reduction in the business activity to identify what predicted expenditure could be reprofiled or surrendered. The Department has advised that it intends to undertake work in the coming weeks to assess the impact of COVID-19. The Committee believes that this is critical to providing an accurate picture of the resources available within the Department to manage the crises and determine if additional funding is required from the centre. Mr Deputy Speaker, leaving aside the COVID-19 pandemic for now, the Department has advised of inescapable pressures of $67.3 million just to stand still, and of this $31.8 million relating to the police operational pressures, $17 million for inflationary pay and, and price increases, $1.5 million for transformational initiatives, and $14.5 million relating to operational pressures, including costs arising from court cases and routine legal aid payments. The Committee asked the Department to provide further information on services or activities that could be reduced or cease and the impact this might have particularly given the assertion that the resource Dell budget falls short of what is required to main current services. The Department also uh, set out a range of matters that it identifies as other significant pressures. That includes EU exit costs, legacy, and the impact of the Bear Scotland case regarding the calculation of overtime pay, which is particularly relevant to the police service. Regrettably, the Department has not provided indicative costs, citing uncertainty regarding timing and scale. However, the Committee does believe that some of this, this information must be known. For example, the police provided an estimate of inescapable legacy-related pressures to the Department, but these were not included in the £31.8 million inescapable pressure attributed to the police that I mentioned earlier. The Department has also advised that costs for these matters are expected to be so significant that they could not be managed within budget and additional funding would be sought from the centre. That suggests that there must be some indication of, we, of what these costs might be. In respect of EU exiting, turning to those costs, uh, funding of £10.7 million was allocated towards those. The Department has advised that this is only a small proportion of the total estimated pressure, but again has failed to provide an indication of what pressure this might be. The reason the Committee has been given for the absence of the detail is that planning for 2019-20 was mostly done on a no-deal basis, which is no longer relevant, and requirements will be informed as the implications of the exit protocol become clear over coming months. The Committee expects to be cut uh, to be kept up to date. Similarly, on new decade, new approach, no costs. Unfortunately, uh, the committee again is unhappy with the Department of Justice at its failure to provide this information uh, to the uh, committee. Mindful of the time, Deputy Speaker, there's a range of areas that I've highlighted where the committee didn't get the figures from the department. The department subsequently goes to the Department of Finance and to the minister seeking additional funding without having done its own internal housekeeping work. I don't believe, and the committee doesn't believe, that's acceptable for the Minister for Justice to fail in that way within her department. I think it's unfair on the Minister of Finance to be faced with requests from the Minister for Justice whenever that department hasn't carried out the work within in its department. And so it's incumbent on the Minister for Justice to do her job, to carry out the work that's necessary before going back to the Department of Finance and seeking further additional funding. I say that outside of being chairman of the committee as well. Totally unreasonable for the Minister of Finance to receive those type of requests when ministers need to evaluate their own priorities based upon the situation that they are now facing. Turning to some brief comments as an individual MLA uh, in the last minute uh, that is available, or 20 seconds, uh, I do think we are in the calm before the storm. I think we're facing significant business problems, closures, unemployment levels, 
and we are going to be faced with an economic crisis that requires this budget and future budgets to really prioritise the support that we need to give to our economy. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I now call on Colin Gildenew, the Chair of the Health Committee. Um, Bo Eichlam Sonri, Fuin Jean Scrudu, Den Kushta Slancha, and Yarnu, or Wishage, Fiha is Fiha Hain. I rise to provide the House with detail of the Health Committee's scrutiny of the 2021 budget. Bo Eichlam Ardus Ahanda Sahorch, Den Chorus Kurum Slancha, Ata Fui Vru Milchenak Fui Lahar, Una Kuramori, Guji and Foran Lehas, Aran Lina Hossi, Gujina Hifigi, Egober, Fui Stuer and Ira. I would first like to acknowledge the enormous pressure under which the health and social care system is working, from care workers and medical staff at the front line through to officials led by the Minister. I understand that the fast-moving situation is making it impossible to provide certainty in terms of spending and service provision in the months ahead. The pre-existing financial waiting list transformation challenges are both impeded and yet made more urgent by the threat to life from COVID-19 which we in the committee recognise, as you have stated, Minister, is an unprecedented crisis. In summary, the Health Committee has been advised that, as things stand, the Department of Health has been provided with an uplift of £399 million as compared with its opening baseline last year. However, given in-year allocations, while welcome, this amounts to a 4.7% increase on its forecast spending. This allocation falls short of the Department's estimated requirements. There is no money to meet new, de new decade, new approach commitments. The transformation budget will be so small that some existing projects will have to be cancelled or paused. And there remains a further funding gap, which means choices may have to be made between some bare minimum inescapable pressures. And it could indeed be worse. The calculated funding gap is based on assumptions that the Trust can carry on meeting standards while achieving further savings. Last can call you. Members will no doubt share my concerns at this picture. Owing to the compressed timescale and the late arrival of papers, the Committee did not come to a formal position on the budget, but we raised the following matters. New Daggett, New Approach. The Department estimates that it requires £169 million to meet the health and care commitments set out in NDNA, including progress and transformation, further provision of IVF treatment, dealing with excessive waiting times for elective care, and the reform of adult social care, upgrading palliative care services and developing a new mental health strategy. For many, the disappointment that there is no funding as yet is all the worse for having had hopes raised. I know that you, Minister, continue to press the British Government to honour their commitments as set out in New Daggett and New Approach. In terms of transformation, we are all agreed it is essential to deal with rising costs. This is a priority agreed across the Executive and indeed reiterated in NDNA. While initially allocated £81 million to fund a standstill approach to transformation, the Department has agreed to divert some of this resource to deal with the underfunding of other inescapable pressures, leaving only £44 million this year available to maintain some, but not all, projects. Nevertheless, this represents not much more than a third of last year's spending and well short of 1% of this year's budget, which is a real concern. In terms of funding gap uh, and scaling back transformation, there remains a funding gap of around £34 million to meet inescapable pressures. However, that £34 million gap assumes the achievement of £72 million worth of savings and that last year's target of £77 million will prove deliverable on a recurrent basis, which officials admit within their briefing to us is a risky assumption. Officials advise that the Department expects Trust to make these 1% savings in low impact manner through efficiencies. We have further work to do to get to the heart of that, and we will apply oversight and accountability into that to explore whether savings are genuinely achieved through more efficient ways of working or, for example, failure to replace a retiring member of staff. In relation to COVID-19, the Department updated the Committee on its assessment of costs, which could run to upwards of £500 million. This is significantly more than has been received to date. However, they have advised us of a degree of confidence that pandemic costs would be met. 
In terms of in-year issues, while allocations are no doubt hugely welcome, particularly at this time, members will appreciate that this is not conducive to long-term planning, which is crucial to transformation and to our charity and community sectors. In conclusion, there is concerning evidence of growing financial strain in the health and social care system and little opportunity to make the type of progress needed to address these strains due to COVID-19 as well as ongoing financial pressures. The committee will continue to monitor the situation and seek to engage constructively as matters progress. I'll ask Sean Corlea, I would now like to add some remarks as Sinn Féin Health Spokesperson. I would like to welcome the speedy resolution of the pay issue at the start of your tenure, Minister, um, in, in relation to our health and social care staff. This reminds us of how vital uh, this was for demonstrating how we value our, our health and social care staff, and I am struck by how quickly that became obvious when the COVID pandemic struck. The pressures brought on by 10 years of austerity have come into sharp focus since the onset of the COVID-19 crisis with shortages of personnel and equipment impacting upon our ability to meet the challenge head on. And ahead of us, we are faced with the uncertainty of a Brexit we did not vote for and what impact that will have on our already shattered health and public services. The COVID-19 crisis has challenged our health and social care system in unprecedented ways. It has highlighted the ravages of 10 years of Tory austerity when we sought to locate suitable PPE, ventilators, and the staff we need to face this challenge head on to save the lives of our people. It has also demonstrated the need for deeper and wider cooperation in the provision of health services across this island to protect all of our people. The Minister for Finance has tried to alleviate the worst of the effects of COVID-19. Um, we also need to resource and work with the charity and community sectors to ensure we address social care and protection for the most vulnerable in our society. Fui Yero, Can Corlia, Nimor Duin, Kosencha Horch, Dargoras, Slancha, Agus Kurum, Sashilda, Ekahima Jid, A Orberch, Komai. It is essential that we protect and promote the need to transform our health and social care systems. This will require proper planning, implementation, and resourcing in the time ahead, and we must grasp this, this nettle collectively to make the changes which we need for our community. I now call on Daniel McCrossan, Chair of the Audit Committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I follow on from uh, my colleagues and other members of this House and paying tribute uh, to uh, our dear friend and colleague John Dallet? Um, it came as a tremendous shock to us all today. Even though he was unwell, it still came as a shock that, it, uh, that he's, he's gone so quickly. John has, was elected in this House for 22 years uh, and uh, spent 45 years of his life as a public servant an unbelievable uh, dedication and commitment to the public, and also a fierce champion uh, of public funds, a man who chased every pound uh, and accounted for every penny uh, when it came to uh, his accountable role on the Public Accounts Committee. John loved his family, loved the SDLP, and loved the people of East Derry. And I think, just to finish on this, Mr. Deputy Speaker, if you indulge. John had a tough and ballsy exterior, but underneath it he was quite a soft, gentle, um, kind man uh, and someone who had a great sense of humour. And I just, I just was thinking there before I, I stood up to speak, the last time that John stood beside me in this chamber was when he stood just behind me there and paid a heartfelt tribute to Seamus Malin and Seamus Malin's death. Uh, this place will certainly be a lot sadder for the loss of a great man, a man who gave his life to uh, so many. Uh, I rise, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, as Chair of the Audit Committee, to reflect the scrutiny of the Budget 2020-2021 for the Northern Ireland Assembly Commission, Northern Ireland Audit Office and Northern Ireland Public Services Ombudsman. The Committee's agreed report on its deliberations was published on 5 March, a debate specifically on the Assembly Commission's budget took place in the Chamber on the 16th of March. The Committee's evidence gathering took place over two meetings on the 13th of February and the 4th of March 2020. All evidence gathered has been published as part of the commission, Committee's report. With the limited time available to me today, I cannot dwell on the detail of the evidence gathered by the Committee. However, I wish to reflect on some particular areas, firstly in relation to the Assembly Commission. 
It is clear that a large part of the Assembly's budget is driven by costs set out in the Assembly members' salaries and expenses determination. The Commission is legally obliged to meet these costs. However, members did question officials on the controllable proportion of the Commission's budget. Elements include income generation options, staff implications of a fully functioning Assembly, the, the Commission's capital budget and staff resources. Members also noted the anticipated financial implications of the New Decade New Approach Agreement, uh, some of which are still uncertain. This will no doubt be a focus for the Assembly Commission going forward and an area uh, of future scrutiny for the Committee. Members were satisfied with the detail presented during its evidence session. However, uh, there is a clear need to have more than one opportunity to examine the Commission's budget. It was also noted that the scrutiny role of the Audit Committee in this regard needs to be codified going forward. Moving on to the Audit Office, members questioned officials uh, on the new business model and the transformation work undertaken in recent times. Members were pleased to see the amount of budget reductions that the Office has been able to make in this regard and received a number of assurances from officials that this has not had a detrimental impact on the work outputs of the Office. Despite having a relatively small budget, members of the Committee were struck by the wide remit of the uh, NIPSO, as well as the growing numbers of complaints considered by the Office since its inception in 2016. Members were particularly interested to hear about the future role of the Office in relation to the Complaint Standards Authority. This, combined with investment and other preventative measures outlined, could lead to huge savings further down the line in terms of reducing the number of complaints uh, finding their way to NIPSO in the first place. The Committee also looks forward to the timely appointment of a permanent Ombudsman, uh, given that the powers of the Acting Ombudsman will expire in July of this year. The Committee would be supportive of a multi-year budgetary frame framework in the future, enabling a more strategic budgetary focus. The Committee would also encourage maximum focus on income generation opportunities. As such, the Department of Finance's budget document has made provision for the figures agreed by the Committee in its report published on 5 March 2020. Uh, I will now, Mr Deputy Speaker, make some comments as SDLP Education Spokesperson and as the MLA for West Tyrone. I would like to thank uh, the Executive and the members present here today for showing a collective front in tackling what has been uh, one of the most serious global public health issues in our lifetime. I would also like to pay tribute to our frontline staff, our health workers, uh, our uh, frontline workers in the community, uh, and also to mention uh, Pat McManus, who sadly lost his life, a Straban man who uh, moved to England some years ago and was a frontline health worker, uh, the first uh, uh, from Northern Ireland to sadly lose their life. Uh, Mr Speaker, turning to the education budget, it remains concerning that all additional pressures uh, within the education budget will not be met in this budget for or a future budget. Taking existing allocations uh, in addition to COVID-19 support, the Department's budget is still £165 million short, and there are no indications as to where the shortfall will impact. The SDLP has major concerns, uh, areas of concern within education, which includes fair teachers' pay, uh, special educational needs, school budget pressures, and the list goes on. These are all pressures that have to be met if we are to ensure that our education system is properly delivering to, for all our children and that no child falls between the gaps. Pre-COVID-19, our school system was crippling at its very knees. And unless proper action is taken, uh, that will continue to be the case when this pandemic is over and when our schools reopen. I am very tight for time, Mr Deputy Speaker, but I would like to touch on uh, supply teachers. I note that we have ended a, a, a long uh, long-time discrimination of our teachers in terms of pay, but as one ends, another begins, because supply teachers uh, have been left uh, uh, to, in the cold in relation to COVID-19. Uh, there is no sign of any funding, although we have heard the commitments of the Department of Education uh, and that they have made a bid to yourself for the £12 million required. These are teachers. They have livelihoods. They have houses to pay for, bills to pay for. They are very concerned, and there needs to be provision for them. In concluding, Mr. Speaker, Deputy Speaker, also the A5. I'll just throw that in there as a one-liner because everyone knows I have to mention it. Uh, to conclude on my remarks today, we are in uncharted waters, and I know this is a testing time for government and for this executive. It is vitally important that the parties around the table, particularly the larger two, pull together in one direction, stop stumping on each other's toes, and do whatever possible to protect our people, to save lives, and to help society recover from COVID-19. This assembly and its survival is more crucial than ever before, and we must work together to ensure that we get through this together. Thank you, Mr. I call Alan Chambers.
Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, I rise to my feet uh, today as the health spokesperson uh, for the Ulster Unionist Party. Uh, this would have already been a difficult budget to align under any normal circumstances. So, with the ongoing challenge of COVID, the actual end of year budget report will, in all likelihood, look very different to what has been discussed today. Given the immediate demands and pressures at hand, it was perhaps understandable that this budget did not include the costs associated with the current response to COVID-19. However, the urgency of the situation must not mean that public money is spent in an ineffective manner. In the weeks and months after the current crisis, there will be time to review how the Executive spent its COVID allocations, but for the time being, its focus must absolutely remain on saving lives. And yet, whilst recognising we are in the midst of the biggest public health emergency in the history of Northern Ireland, we must also remember that much of the day-to-day -day work of the health service has to continue. People are still having strokes and cardiac arrests. Women are still giving birth. And all our health workers, more than ever before, need and deserve their pay. They earn every penny. With an ageing population and with increasing complexities and comorbidities and medications, it is little wonder that this year's forecast expenditure needed to increase by 6 per cent just to maintain existing services. It is welcome that the Health Service was to receive an additional £399.6 million. However, that included £170 million for the Agenda for Change pay deal that had already been committed to by the Executive. The Department had stated clearly that it needed £492 million as an absolute minimum just to meet inescapable costs. With this allocation, it means the Health Service was facing an immediate funding shortfall of £92 million. As a result of the shortfall in funding, unfortunately, the Department may find itself in a position of having no choice but to use money that had been earmarked for transformation instead. Transformation is key, yet this budget sadly did not acknowledge that. When all this is over and done, our waiting times, which were already by far the worst in the UK, will be even more frightening. The Executive has broadly done the right thing in recent weeks by giving the Department of Health the thousands, uh, the money it needed to support care homes, to pay for the thousands of new staff coming on the payroll, and to protect essential services such as community pharmacies. But all parties must also recognise the cost of repairing the psychological and physical damage of this virus will demand serious attention and serious resources for years to come. People who needed an operation on their hip before COVID-19 will still require it after COVID-19. Can I ask members to be careful the, the microphone is picking up some uh, uh, interference. The mic is interfering. If you just be careful. Sorry. Okay, continue. The end of this pandemic will end one major challenge for our health ministry but will reopen another major challenge to address waiting lists that will, as I have said, undoubtedly be higher than when Minister Swan came into office in January. If I could just quote the Health Minister, uh, Robin Swan, uh, when he spoke in this chamber last week, he said, let us resolve to do better for the health service that has stood so firmly by us, to fund it properly long term and transform it for the better. Let that, let that be one of the lasting legacies of this period we are living through. Let that be the true, lasting tribute to those we applaud every Thursday night. In conclusion, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I would like to place on record the appreciation we owe the Treasury in London for the major additional funds they have made available to the Executive to tackle the current health crisis and to help mitigate its economic impact on our citizens and businesses. If we ever needed reminding of the practical benefits of being part of the United Kingdom, this crisis has provided it. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I call Paul Free. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. This budget, knowing that 
what we're actually debating here and the facts and figures and the numbers in front of us isn't really a true reflection of what the budget is going to be. Um, so in, in that sense, it's, it is, whilst it's useful to put on record and enhance our, um, our concerns and our queries and our wishes and our wants, uh, we do come with that caveat that the budget will probably be something completely different by the end of the financial year, given the crisis that we are in. And I also realise the, the slow cogs of government turning at a different pace than this emergency uh, dictates. Uh, and that's why, then, I suppose most of the Barnet consequentials have been left out uh, and are on a, a different page, if you like. So I, 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 I come with that knowledge that we are in unprecedented times and that things are very fast moving. And it has been difficult for a lot of the departments, not least the finance department, in managing this and coping with this and trying to get the grips with this crisis. But can I say that some departments have handled it better than others? Some also have had a burden more than others. Some have had to learn quickly rather than others. Some, if you like, haven't really been affected and some have been at the heart of this battle. And so that should be then reflected on any budget settlement that we can produce. And that's where I worry. I worry that we have the capacity and the ability to actually think strategically. Thank goodness, as many members have said here, for Barnet Consequentials and the benefits of being in a strong union and the, the financial power and weight that that brings. And of course, it was nearly on a daily basis money was floating down to help us and help the executive formulate plans, some of which we mirrored from uh, mainland UK or GB, and some then we have taken upon ourselves because things are different, and that's fine, as long as we have a strategic vision and plan. Can I say I am worried, whilst the, the first, I think it was a very original Barnet consequential float down of 120 million, went straight in and directly in to help uh, the rates with providing a three month rates holiday. I do worry that we have not yet been able to expand on that. Because the rates, the rates that we bring in makes up a very small percentage of our income. But for some businesses, especially in this day and age, it's going to mean everything. Everything. And remember, businesses were affected by the re-evaluation in the first place, where there was massive change in some quarters. And they were struggling and wondering how they were going to see it through. And then they've been hit with this COVID-19. So some of those businesses are in a very difficult place. And I would appeal to the minister in the department and the executive, by extension, we need to think this through strategically as to how we provide the best support to our businesses. And in some cases, it will be throwing money at them. And in many other cases, it will be ensuring that the burden, financial burden on them going forward is not too great. And when you look at the small percentage of our rates payout, or what we receive, compared to our overall income, it doesn't, it doesn't compare to what businesses have to deal with, uh, with regards to their budgetary positions. And rates could be the final straw. If it's not rates, it could be something else. So let's try and support those businesses as best we can with regards to not placing a burden on them. What is clear, what is clear with the Minister's statements so far this financial year is that he has added flexibility to the system. And that's good. That's well and good for departments to be able to move money about and move money into the centre and one thing or another. And that's essential that that takes place. But have I yet to see a strategic vision, a plan? No, no, I don't think I have. I don't think I have sought here. And of course, when we were speaking here with regards to the budget debates, and that was before the COVID-19 emergency, a lot of us asked, where is the vision? Where are we going to do things differently? 
What about investment in infrastructure that has been mentioned here by my colleague? What about bringing in an age of decisionism? What about aligning the budget with an outcomes-based programme for government? What about major recovery plans now for COVID-19 businesses that are affected? Mitigation measures for our community and an ageing house stock that was also raised here today. Those were issues and emergencies before this emergency took hold. But yet, have we really dealt with them? No, we haven't, not according to this budget. And I worry for the future. Are we, have we the capacity to get us out the other side of this emergency and then win the war, but then also win the peace with regards to the outlying issues that are at hand and have always been there, and we haven't been able to grapple and fix them up to this point? The water infrastructure, the energy issue, it's all sitting there, buzzing away, waiting to be fixed, and it's not being fixed. And that will hurt people in the recovery getting through this. Even if we get through the health emergency, and even if we can get through some sort of econ economic recovery, these burdens still lie with us, and we still haven't resolved them yet, and I worry about that. With regards to the actual detail of the budget, some queries I would have, Mr Deputy Speaker, I can understand the uplift, the, the percentage change in most of the departments. It doesn't seem to be that strategic. It just seems to be a layering up of the, the big beasts of the departments that we have, and then a, wee, a lesser amount for the, the smaller departments. One that, strikes, remarks to one that strikes me, Mr. Speaker, is the executive office, uh, the 72.4% jump. I'm taking that's the historical institutional abuse implementation of 37.5 million, but he could clarify that for me. Up. Thank you very much. And now I call Declan McAleer, the Chair of the Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs Committee. Uh, uh, I would like to just uh, start off by also expressing condolences to uh, the family of John Dallet uh, on his sad passing. And I have known John from back in the, the days of the DRD Committee, and, and just recently he was a member of the ERA Committee, replaced by by Pat, uh, by Pat Catney, and he's dedicated, he was a dedicated uh, public representative and very effective in his role as a legislator and a, a, scrutin, a scrutinizer of, of public policy. And even in recent times, uh, I noted that even though he was, he was visibly ill and weakening in, in recent times, um, he was still as sharp as a razor, perhaps spotting you know, like salient or a small piece of detail in the middle of a raft of documents. So he'd be badly missed uh, here and by his party and more so by his, his loving family. So just uh, in the capacity as chairperson of the ERA committee, in February the committee began its engagement with the department on the budget requirements for 2021. And the situation in mid-February, as we know, was very different to the one we have now in light of the COVID crisis. The first matter I want to draw attention to is funding uh, of direct payments for farmers. And previously, this had been via the CAP uh, Pillar 1, funding coming from the EU to Westminster and then on to the four regions. And the, um, the, 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 uh, the method of distribution between the four regions, including that, uh, should be ring fenced as well established. Uh, how it was ring fenced as well established and been in place for some time. The committee welcomes the fact that £293 million has been secured for 2021, but we have concerns about what will replace the funding of the basic payment and what form it will take in future years. The Bureau review made recommendations regarding the farm support budget 20 to 22. Uh, that may see us with reduced amounts of funding for farm support, and again, that's a concern. Uh, major, actually, it's a major area of concern for the farming and wider rural community, particularly the current situation, and many of our food producers, producers are facing the financial crisis as a result of COVID-19. Can we explore the possibility of farm support schemes and uh, an ANC scheme, which uh, a motion was passed in this chamber regarding? We noted that in the 2019-20 financial year, DERA had reduced resource requirements of £12 million, and we asked questions regarding the possibility of using this underspend for a future ANC scheme. And DERA uh, responded that the reduced requirements uh, do not become uh, firmed up until um, the last monitoring round of the financial year, and that all reduced requirements over a million must be automatically sur surrendered at the earliest opportunity. Thus, the time frame for identification and surrender meant that it was not possible to deliver a, a foreign support uh, ANC scheme. Uh, related to the replacement of CAP uh, Pillar 1 uh, are the Committee's concerns on replacement funding through the Rural Development Programme that currently largely derives from CAP Pillar 2. 
There's 10.8 million of non-ring uh, non fenced uh, funding set aside for the rural development programme, specifically leader and forestry. And this is to continue with schemes such as rural business investment scheme, rural basic services, village renewable, and this is welcomed by the committee. A further 6.3 million has been set aside under capital uh, for the environmental farming scheme and rural tourism, and 9.7 million for the farm business improvement schemes. The EFS funding would allow for the rollout of the next tranche of that programme that brings environmental benefits to farms. Members have considered the EFS previously and noted that the rates of subsidies should be reviewed in order to maximise environmental uh, sustainability and that they are economically sustainable for the for and attractive. In terms of the new decade, new approach, we welcome the three million for Tripsy. Uh, this uh, is to be used for community facilities, fuel poverty, road transport. Seven million secured on the Rural Business Community Fund uh, to replace the, e the current EU Priority 6 element is also welcome. Uh, we are aware that the COVID-19 is having a deep impact on rural areas, many of which are isolated um, from essential services such as shops and uh, medical services. It has underlined the need for reliable and fast broadband provision. Uh, patchy, pa sorry, patchy broadband provision in some areas is therefore worrying. To that end, the committee noted and welcomed that the 7.5 million of um, capital funding set aside for Project Stratum. The committee also welcomes the support for the Rural Affairs Division, provides to arrange the statutory community and voluntary groups to provide support in rural areas during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, rural development is largely funded from CAPS pillars, uh, Pillar 2 and other EU sources and is intended that this replacement will come from the Shared Prosperity Fund. However, um, we are very concerned that there is no, we do not have any clarity as regards the um, details of the Shared Prosperity Fund policy. Uh, we have not we are not aware of the Pilgard T replacement funding will be ring-fenced. This creates a degree of concern and uncertainty um, about the future of rural communities funding. The um, committee has serious concerns with the, the lack of clarity and the lack of information on the uh, future shared prosperity uh, fund. Okay. Um, we're also pleased to see that uh, 2.2 2, uh, 2, 2 million has been allocated for staff to deliver the new climate change legislation, as well as a scoping study of the independent uh, environmental protection agency and the um, uh, leader study. In connection with the Independent Environmental Protection Agency, the committee draws attention to the, the Environment Bill that is currently making its way through Westminster. Large, large parts of the bill apply to here, particularly the Office of Environmental Protection, and we are still concerned with the lack of clarity on the role of the EEP, OEP and how it will interact with the NAEA and the, um, here. Uh, we also know the, the, that the COVID-19 crisis means that there will likely be delays in the rollout of, of many projects. Uh, many projects, and this means a consideration has been given to the reallocation of resources to meet the current emergency as part of the June monitoring. Um, well, the committee has some, some concerns also around the EU exit, many concerns. The budget, uh, budget allocated to the Department of 2019-20 was not included in this baseline. It is additional money that the uh, Department must bid for on year. Uh, the committee noted that 23.6 million resource non-ring uh, fenced has been allocated for EU exit costs. Um, so um, I want to just jump on very quickly. One of the biggest concerns that we do have is the uh, agri-food sector. It has taken the biggest hit during the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and you know, farmers are our primary food producers and they are facing an unprecedented crisis. I know there has been a bid made to the, uh, the Westminster and the EU uh, for 100 or 105 million pound package. Uh, this is really, really uh, important at this particular time. The member draws remarks to close. Measures, not, measures do not apply to the agri-food um, industry. So I just want to um, just conclude by pleasing or calling for support for the agri-food agri -food industry and our farm and rural communities at this very difficult time. I call Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, um, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I thank the Minister for his statement and rise to speak on a budget set in what is unprecedented and uncertain times in the history of this place. Nobody in this chamber can say with any confidence what the future may hold, with departments already burning through cash so quickly 
that another vote on account is now soon again required to release more money to spend, just over a mere month since the start of the financial year. We are therefore being asked to vote upon what could be best described as a blindfold budget without any clear view of what the year ahead may bring. Many issues contribute to the uncertainty, whether it be as a result of COVID-19 and the lack of hard evidence on how successful loosening the lockdown will be in keeping R under one, or be it the risk of a no-deal Brexit as a result of the failure to positively conclude trade negotiations and a refusal to request an extension. The ability of our health service to deal with potentially a colossal surge in non-COVID-19 wait lists is also a real concern, something my colleague Paula Bradshaw will speak about later. Coming back after a three-year political hiatus, the Assembly was already facing significant financial challenges, with key decisions deferred for years, year-on-year -year funding cuts due to, the, due to the politics of austerity, and the failure of the UK Government to honour the financial commitments set out a new decade, new approach. Setting a budget was already going to be tough before COVID-19 arrived. A quick review of the bids for additional funding from departments due to COVID-19 versus the monies available from additional Barnet consequentials and the allocations made to date make sobering reading, pointing to a financial crisis of unparalleled measure if further and extremely substantial Barnet consequentials are not forthcoming. The welcome decision to provide increased flexibility to ensure essential frontline public services can continue will help, but without this additional funding, a way needs to be found to ensure executive departments can continue to operate on a sound financial basis, but not just now, but throughout until the end of the year, to ensure that frontline public services continue to be delivered by workers who must be properly and fairly paid. Access to the UK reserved by the devolved administrations for COVID-19 related reasons announced by the Chancellor on the 11th of March is a welcome, but as of yet not, we have not received any indication from the Executive or the Department of Finance whether it is intended to use this power and what options could be utilised to repay the monies obtained as a result of such. I would therefore be most grateful if the Minister could detail more in relation to whether this uh, is being considered and the, whether also the Executive is uh, prepared to consider utilising its albeit, however limited, borrowing powers to safeguard businesses and stimulate economic recovery, recognising how vital it is that the Northern Ireland Executive does all it can to protect workers' jobs and livelihoods. A well thought out stimulus plan and targeted investment could be the difference between a short recession and a long depression, and the livelihoods of hundreds and thousands of citizens uh, depend upon it. All citizens need to be, all departments need to be part of this, with capital and resource spending critical, including the maximum possible utilisation of financial transactions capital to aid our construction sector. Regardless as to whether, uh, as to whether the Chancellor realises the need to fund the recovery on the same basis as the interventions made to date, the need for us to face up to and make the difficult decisions. Uh, and, and to reform how our public services are delivered will not go away. In fact, in light of the major financial challenges now being endured and the colossal changes inevitable as a result of the pandemic, we simply cannot afford taking the tough decisions, that of many of which have been around for decades. There is simply no more road to kick the can down. Whether it is tackling the cost of division, implementing Bengoa, implementing the recommendations arising from the independent review on education, the mutualisation of Northern Ireland Water, or delivering modern working practices fit for 2020. The failure to face up to hard and potentially unpopular decisions just isn't an option anymore. COVID-19 provides more, not less, reason to urgently reform our public services. At this point, uh, before I touch upon my other brief as the party's infrastructure spokesperson, I should declare that I was previously an employee of TransLink. Whilst COVID-19 will eventually pass, the need to tackle climate change and avert catastrophe uh, will not. Our, our way out of lockdown and the pandemic must be a, a well-funded green recovery, 
not towards even more cars choking up our streets and polluting our atmosphere. The Department of Infrastructure will play a vital role in ensuring this, but to date has failed to be allocated sufficient funds from COVID-19 monies, apart from £90 million set aside for ferries, airports and logistics. I recognise and welcome the previous commitments given by the Finance Minister for necessary funding to be provided, but for the Department to plan ahead, these promises soon need to materialise. It is not sufficient for the Department of Finance merely to state that DFI should reprioritise their existing budgets in order to address pressures emerging due to the COVID-19 situation. The financial implications um, of the way we will have to travel, the downturn on non-domestic water charges, reduced planning fees and, and charges levied, levied by DVA cannot be funded within existing budgets. I hope the Finance Minister will be able to elaborate more on what he will be able to do to aid a good quality infrastructure and the other points that I have raised. And I would like to thank the officials for all the work they have been doing over the last number of weeks and in what are extremely challenging circumstances. Thank you. Members, we are due to change personnel at the table, and it has been a long debate already. Uh, so I propose that we take a short comfort break for everyone's benefit. By leave of this, the Assembly, we will suspend the sitting until 4.35 p.m. The first person to speak when we return will be Pam Cameron. The sitting is by leave suspended. Order, members. That uh, ends the suspension of the sitting. And the next person on the speaking list is Mrs Pam Cameron. Thank you, um, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I just put on record uh, my condolences to the family and friends and indeed the colleagues of uh, John Dallet at this very sad time. It's a, it's a very difficult time for, for anyone to be grieving. And in these circumstances, we, I know we're all thinking about his, um, his family and indeed his colleagues at this very difficult time. Uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I rise to make some brief remarks in relation to the allocations to the Department of, um, of Health as DP spokesperson and a member of the Health Committee. If there ever was a time when the need to fund our health service was as evident, it is surely now. Resourcing our NHS to make it fit to tackle any crisis that comes our way, like COVID-19, but also to ensure the daily needs of those ill and suffering across Northern Ireland are met. We must also focus on adequately resourcing our most valuable asset in our health service, our staff, and let this House never again see nurses on strike to bring about a fair pay settlement. Resourcing, of course, comes in two areas, staff resourcing and that, of course, equipping uh, the estate. I believe the budget does that. While we would all want more, we work within finite resources, where prioritisation is fundamental to the best outcomes possible from the funding envelope available. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, in terms of resource budgets, we are talking astronomical sums of money. An extra £400 million is needed next year, and we do have inescapable pressures arising from new decade, new approach around nursing and midwifery training, safe staffing and transformation. Moving ahead, transformation is vital to continued effectiveness for our local NHS. For that to be planned effectively, we need to move towards a multi-year budget. Providing clarity over time to plan change in a more strategic way, we also need to have clarity around the £72 million savings target. Is this realistic, given the pressures from COVID-19? And if it isn't, where is the revised target? In terms of capital spend, we really do need that longer-term strategic approach that comes with multi-year budgets. We also need clarity on the status of the capital projects pre-committed, not least the mother and baby unit. We think of Bengoa and the reform of our health service, including its estate, and we need the progress on this sooner rather than later if budgeting is to be truly the best use of the money that is available. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, there can be no underestimating the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on our health service and its budgets. 
next year's budget will be one dominated by COVID-19 and the response to it. And that is right. And will, um, and it, of course, it is very sadly needed. We will have to see how the additional costs will be met. We will also have to assess how suspension of other services has produced savings elsewhere in our healthcare system. These are issues for investigations on another day, perhaps, but there are challenges coming down the tracks towards us, and there are challenges we cannot dodge or delay indefinitely. The bottom line is we need more money moving forward. In that regard, we must get clarity from our government, the government of the Irish Republic, in terms of the commitments made, a new decade, new approach. We must also push ahead with transformation at pace. Most importantly, to succeed, we need to be able to plan on a multi-year basis. Thank you. Thank you. I call Ms Karen Mullen. At last Concordia, I would also like to send my condolences to John da Dalit's family and his SDLP colleagues at this time. Our thoughts are with you all. I'd like to thank the Minister for his statement, and today I rise as Sinn Féin Education Spokesperson to welcome the news that the Department of Education has received an 11% increase in its resource budget on last year. This is a significant increase in the education budget for 10 years, or the first significant increase. This is a step towards addressing the huge shortfall that has come about in the system as a consequence of a decade of Tory policy. The increase in funding to the Department of Education has also made it possible to make a long-awaited awaited pay award to our teachers, and I would like to commend all involved in making this happen. The onset of COVID-19 has brought with it much tragedy and uncertainty, but I want to, at this stage, pay tribute to our teaching and non-teaching staff, our youth and childcare services, and the wider education sector for how they have adapted to continue to deliver educational, youth and childcare services. Like every other department, education has had to make changes to its initial budget plans and build for ex bid for extra resources to deal with the emergency we find ourselves in. Last week, the Education Committee had a budget briefing from department officials and were informed of some of those changes and their ongoing bids. I welcome this proactive approach and I would also ask that the Education Minister does all he can to make the necessary funding available to support our day-to-day -day substitute teachers who have been without an income since this crisis began. The Finance Minister's announcement of at least £227 million of additional funding to the Department of Education is hugely welcomed and should be commended. The funding, this funding boost is hopefully the beginning of the turning of the tide in the crisis of school budgets. Our school leaders need to be able to prepare and plan in the confidence that they have the resources they require to deliver for their pupils. It is also welcome news that over £40 million has been made available for special education needs provision. In recent years, special education needs has been starved of resources and investment. The Education Authority has consistently exceeded its budget in this regard. This highlights the shortage of funding that was going into special education needs provision. I am hopeful that this additional funding announced by Minister Murphy will help to address some of these difficulties and will alleviate some of the other pressures facing children with special education needs and their families. In a very short period of time, and in what are very difficult circumstances, the Finance Minister has not only delivered a much-needed increase to the education budget, but he has made real-term increases to all the executive budgets. As the fin Finance Minister has already stated, the block grant to the North is still lower than it was prior to austerity. This means that pressures will continue to exist. With these pressures in mind, it is important that we get our priorities straight. We must deliver on the basis of objective need, an area of work I will be keen to see progressed as closing the attainment gap between our most disadvantaged pupils and their better off peers. In this context, we must seek to ensure a culture of collaboration, joined up thinking and working across the executive. Departments should be able to and should be encouraged to share costs in achieving common outcomes. 
Yesterday, in Derry and Straban, we received confirmation of the long-awaited City Deal Match funding. This funding can be a catalyst for regeneration after decades of neglect and underinvestment. While this is welcome, further work needs done. Derry has an unfortunate history of being ignored and discriminated against when it comes to developing our university. We now have an opportunity to put that approach behind us. I am calling on the Health Minister and the Minister for Economy to sign off on the Graduate Entry Medical School for the Ulster University, McGee, without further delay. Graham Ogut. Mr Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. And before I um, start my remarks in earnest, um, having reflected on um, the passing of our colleague John Dallet earlier, I, I'd just like to thank um, various members who have shared their condolences through the course of this debate. Um, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, every time we've debated budgets in this place since January, we've had to acknowledge extraordinary circumstances. Earlier this year, we were debating spending allocations which had already been committed. Then we voted on account for spending which had already happened. Now we are debating a budget which has already been rendered partly obsolete by COVID-19 and the subsequent response. Budgets are always works in progress. They are always statements designed to be revised and reworked as new information becomes available. But that does not mean they shouldn't be scrutinised in their own terms. This budget has things that are welcome, things that are worrying, and many things that are left out. We know that the COVID-19 crisis will create not just new challenges in our, public service, in our public services and our economy, but it will ruthlessly expose all the existing weaknesses that we have procrastinated over since the end of the conflict here. We don't know precisely when we will be out of the crisis, but, we, but when we are, we know, and various speakers have reflected this, that we will need to take a fresh look at how we organise our public services and our economy, and that will require a fresh and detailed look at our fiscal position. Clear long-term budgeting will need to be at the core of that, but with respect, this budget, for obvious reasons, is neither long-term nor clear. There is some avoidable confusion in the document. For example, several, dep several departments staked they are working to, work, to working to deliver outcomes based on the draft programme for government. Presuming this refers to the 2016 draft programme for government, it would be useful to know what the current status of that document is. It would appear from some departmental chapters that some departments are working to those outcomes, including uh, the Department of Economy and DERA, but others are not. This confusion is in part a product of the mash of packages from which funding has been derived over the past number of years, which are in part a product of the stop-start nature of devolution here. Fresh start, confidence and supply, new decade, new approach. They could be new records from a band that, has long, that had great promise 20 years ago, but whose fans have long since grown tired of hype promises that never quite deliver and public rise between members. Many of the packages were in and of themselves welcome and necessary, but the way in which they have been delivered add confusion to executive budgeting, with pots of hypothecated money left here and there, others half, left half-filled or cynically double-counted by the Treasury, as with the, the, some of the new decade new approach money uh, that we've talked about already. That, along with the enormous financial scandal of RHI, has frayed public confidence, but it has also led to a significant level of confusion about our budgeting processes among the public. Indeed, I would estimate that there is a fairly high level of confusion about our budgeting processes in the Northern Ireland Assembly. That is one of the many reasons we need to introduce much greater clarity on budget processes than exist at present, and that includes how we are spending COVID-19 money. We have large amounts of money centrally held for fairly vaguely described items such as business support and support for vulnerable members of society. And while I acknowledge these are extremely important things, completely vital, we need to know where exactly that money is being spent. On the other hand, the additional COVID-19 allocations do not so far contain any funding at all for the infrastructure department. As others have said, it would be helpful to understand why. Why also, and this is a, a, an important question, is £2.3 million being held centrally to pay the UK exchequer for the cost of lower long-haul air passenger duty, which was something that was um, devolved to us a number of years ago. But there are currently no long-haul flights from Northern Ireland, and for that matter, global aviation of all kinds, short and long-haul, have collapsed. Why, are we, why is that £2.3 million being held? There may be a good reason that I don't understand, but it would, it would be helpful to know why. One use of that £2.3 million, pounds, and it would take significantly less than that, would be my plan, which I have published and recommended to the Executive to save and protect local media. I hope the Minister and others can get on board with that. Indeed, the Newry Reporter, his local paper, is one of those that have had to furlough its operations. So I hope the Executive can get behind that. That is one small way we could use that money. But as I said, this crisis will reveal 
uh, even more sharply the challenges we already faced but have, uh, but have failed to deal with. And this is something that we all bear responsibility for. Our economy is among the least productive in these islands, and when you leave aside our hallowed grammar schools, we have poor educational outcomes. Our public spending has failed to deliver on infrastructure investment, and that's made our productivity problem even worse. And where we do have skilled young people, we have a shocking inability to keep them here or to bring them back once they leave. Added to which we have the looming threat of an exit from the Brexit transition period without a new trade deal and with the UK government apparently backsliding on its commitment to implement the Ireland Protocol. This budget barely mentions Brexit, although there are some specific allocations. I hope the Minister, I'm sure he would, would agree with my call to ask that the executive as a whole should ask for an extension on behalf of Northern Ireland. For all of these reasons, we urgently need to match our budget plans to long-term strategy for the future of our public services and our economy. I would urge the Finance Minister, and I think we may be in some agreement on this, to bring forward plans for both the Fiscal Council pledged in New Decade New Approach, but also the Fiscal Commission he has suggested that needs to be joined up to, our, to, to an operation of long-term economic forecasting too. We need to have a long, hard look at how we get out of the funk of simply going in supplication to an often cynical or just distracted UK Treasury. And I would say respectfully to some of my colleagues in the Finance Committee, including the Chair, who is no longer with us, that while the UK Exchequer might seem it's, uh, generous at certain moments, supplication is not a long-term acceptable strategy for Northern Ireland fiscal strategy. What are the other ways we can find to invest in our public services and making our economy here more productive? Why, for example, are we not making use of our limited borrowing powers? The cost of borrowing is very low at the minute. This year, why are we not using the re reinvestment reform initiative to invest in the productivity and infrastructure that we so sorely lack and that we will need to recover properly from the COVID-19 crisis? And what are our plans to make better use of financial transactions capital? Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, we are currently placed in the invidious position of having one meaningful and politically acceptable form of revenue raising, that are ra rates, and specifically non-domestic rates. But we know that these rates fall hardest on the sectors of the economy that will be hit worst by COVID-19, that is to say hospitality and retail. That cannot be, cannot be right. Mr. Speaker, the world around us, Dep Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, the world around us has changed. We cannot avoid changing any longer. Let this be the last budget based on short-term fixes and moving around pots of money. Let's all do better next time. Thank you. I call Mr. Gary Middleton. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I join with uh, colleagues in passing on uh, my sympathies and condolences to the family uh, and loved ones of uh, Mr. John Dallet, MLA, and indeed to uh, our SDLP colleagues as well. I know this is a difficult time uh, for, for, for everyone, but particularly for those who are bereaved, uh, and my sympathies are with them. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, we all recognise that this budget process is like no other, uh, given the fact that we find ourselves in the situation uh, with COVID-19. The challenging financial pressures that many within our communities and our businesses are, are currently facing is evident to us all. It has been long been the case that the Department for Health uh, has been the priority, uh, and of course that should remain the case, uh, but at the same time we know that uh, there needs to be a greater emphasis in terms of some of the other departments as well. These budget allocations have, of course, been overshadowed by the uh, public health crisis that we currently find ourselves in, and, and the document itself refers to the fact that the response to COVID-19 has been developed mainly outside the budget 2021 20, uh, process. And we acknowledge the fact that that needed to be the case to allow for uh, money to be uh, issued quickly and also uh, to allow for the flexibility as well. So the context within which the current budget process has taken place is indeed extremely fluid, uh, making it very difficult for um, committees to scrutinise the budget, uh, and it's actually next to, uh, to near impossible to do that. Uh, but at the same time, we do recognise the, the unique position that we're all in. There is no doubt that whilst uh, we, 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 there, there's issues within the budget, we do have to be mindful that whatever we do, the priority should be protecting lives and livelihoods during this pandemic. I welcome the additional funding allocated in response uh, to the COVID-19 crisis to maintain our public services, support our businesses and protect the vulnerable as well. My comments today will be very much focused in and around the elements uh, relevant to the Department for the Economy. At the recent meeting of the Economy Committee, we heard from the Economy Minister about the actions being taken within her department uh, to support business. 
It is very much welcome that the Department for Economy has received £370 million uh, so far for its COVID-19 response, with a total requirement of £418 million. Uh, particularly, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, the uh, Small Business Grant Scheme, uh, £270 million, which is allocated to that, has been, uh, in my opinion, very effective, has saved uh, a number of businesses. We appreciate that that's uh, short term and we need uh, more support going forward to, to try and kickstart our economy again. Uh, the, the 25K scheme, the £100 million that was allocated to that, again, it's a good news story. Uh, there's people that are no doubt falling uh, between the gaps, but I, I would urge the, the Finance Minister to work with the Economy Minister to ensure that whatever gaps are there, whatever businesses are, st are still falling between the stools in that respect, uh, we need to get the support to them uh, sooner rather than later. As we move forward, uh, the Minister at the Economy uh, Committee mentioned the need for looking at the, the recovery phase. Without starting too soon, and be mindful of the ongoing concerns, we do need to start looking at how we plan to uh, get our businesses back on their feet and through this uh, crisis and start to rebuild our economy again. In last week's briefing to our committee, officials indicated that there may well be elements of the departmental budget and that of its arms length bodies that can be repurposed uh, for, for the COVID-19 response. Again, it's making uh, scrutiny of this very difficult. On their contribution, they did flag up the fact that resource-related high-priority pressures existed of between 180 and 210 million. Again, most of that's relating to the COVID-19 response. With regard to capital inescapable pressures, the department had indicated a total of 70 million, which again includes two significant sums of money for construction work and associated costs for further education and invest NIEU funding. As a key driver of the COVID-19 response, the Department for the Economy must have its budgetary needs prioritised. The committee looks forward to the outcome of the June monitoring round uh, to better assess where the Department's budget uh, position sits. The, document, the budget document also highlights the Department's key policy initiatives for 2021. Uh, key current policy focuses includes the skills strategy, supporting our skills system, and the change in needs of individuals and the economy, the tourism strategy, the energy strategy, uh, city deals covering tourism, innovation, digital, uh, and skills projects, and of course, preparing and managing the EU exit consequences. So there's a number of areas which, as a committee, we need to focus on, but the budget needs to be there to ensure that we can deal uh, with a lot of these issues going forward. I want to now turn to a few of the recent announcements made, uh, particularly in regards to the city deal. Uh, very much welcome news. We know that uh, last year the UK government uh, announced the funding package for, for the city deal and the Innovative Future Fund. Uh, welcome news, and I, and I very much welcome the executive uh, decision to match fund that. That, that is progress. Um, it has been welcomed by all of the stakeholders. Uh, and I do want to take, on, uh, take this opportunity to thank those key stakeholders for uh, lobbying ourselves as political representatives and to our ministers as well for getting that over the line. Uh, I think that that's good news and welcome to try and get our economy moving again as we come out of this, uh, this crisis. Uh, the other issue I want to turn to is around the medical school. Uh, we know that that is something which is very much part of the uh, New Decade New Approach document. Again, the medical school, we need to see that uh, get over the line. Uh, I'm working with uh, my colleague in the Department for Economy, uh, and, and we know that other executive ministers are very much uh, pushing to get that over the line. I think that, that needs to happen sooner rather than later. If anything, um, the current crisis highlights the fact that there's a real need for the medical school to train our doctors to ensure that they're working, uh, living and residing in the North West. So that's something that we cannot allow to fall off the radar, and we need to ensure that gets over the line uh, before the end of May. Uh, and just finally, I wanted also just to put on record uh, the appreciation for the, the package for the, the airports. Uh, we know that the, the, the airport in London Derry is vital for our local tourism industry and, and for our businesses as well. These are all things that we need to support uh, and continue to support as we make our way through uh, the current crisis. And I would just urge the, the, the Finance Minister to prioritise, uh, along with Health, the Department for Economy, because it's going to be one of the key departments in ensuring that we can get through uh, the current crisis. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I call Mr. Cathal Boylan. Can I echo some of the comments already in relation to John Dallet and extend her sympathies and condolences to him and his family and both to the, his colleagues here, the privilege of working with John on 
a number of committees here over the last 13 years. Um, Mr. Speaker, or Principal Deputy Speaker, I raised to speak as uh, infrastructure spokesperson for the party. The Department for Infrastructure has many responsibilities, including the maintenance of our roads, public transport, water and sewage services, and planning, to name a few. They are important services that people use on a daily basis, and this is something I believe is recognised by the Finance Minister, who held this portfolio in a previous mandate, and he's well versed with the responsibilities now that lies within DFI. His recognition is demonstrated by the 8.6 per cent rise in the resource budget and an increase of 89 million in capital allocation from the previous year's opening budget. In fact, this is by far the highest resource budget increase that the Department has received in a single year since its inception of DFA. Compared to the 2016 budget, last year's resource allocation only rose by around 3 per cent. In light of this, the Finance Minister's allocation can be viewed as a welcome change from past budgets and demonstrates that the Minister is fully aware of pressures felt by the Department. I would also commend the Finance Minister on his recognition of the importance of transport and connectivity during the coronavirus pandemic, as he, as he along with all our executive colleagues, has secured support for our airports. Additionally, £95 million has been centrally held for transport issues. Looking ahead, the recent announcement of the £700 million of funding will also help develop key infrastructure projects throughout the North, and that is to be welcomed. These are not normal circumstances for a budget, and the reality is that the response to the COVID-19 pandemic cannot be held within the confines of the conventional departmental budgets. We need to look at our response to this pandemic in a holistic fashion. That is why, instead of allocating funding on a departmental basis, the Executive has agreed the funding to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic on a needs basis. We also need to look at this budget in the context in order to completely understand our current situation. To do this, we have to recognise the crippling effects that 10 years of Tory austerity has had on our public services. COVID-19 has reminded people of the importance of core public services and the people who deliver them. However, the same public services have been stripped in funding for years and years under austerity. This is evident in the fact that even with 8.6 per cent rise in the resource budget, it still leaves significant departmental budgetary pressures. The reality is the Department for Infrastructure has been dealing with constraints for years as a result of Tories' reckless financial policies. Under normal circumstances, austerity was really highly damaging to our public services. Now, however, it is this same stripping away of public expenditure that is harming the Department's ability to respond to COVID-19. TransLink, for example, is experiencing a reduction of 90 to 95 per cent in passengers. If they did not have to eat into the reserves for the past few years as a result of austerity, they would likely be in a stronger position to deal with this crisis. Instead, TransLink were already calling for much-needed additional funding way before this virus arrived in this island. Now their situation has escalated as the entire department is now facing significant pressures as a result of this crisis, mostly within public transport, NA Water and DVA. The consequences of the austerities disregard for public services is demonstrated in full during a time of public emergency and is a testament to its failure as a policy. This is also compounded by the fact that the British Government have reneged on their commitments within the new decade, new approach, one of which was turbocharging the infrastructure. And then you have to consider the costs of Brexit also upon the North. Although it is difficult to assess the total costs, it is safe to say that the loss of access to co-financing provided through competitive programmes such as Connecting Europe facility will have a detrimental impact regarding our infrastructure. To conclude, I commend the work of the Finance Minister who has done within the context of this heavily constrained environment to address these challenges, demonstrated in the biggest increase to the DFA's resource budget since the Department was created, a significant jump in capital allocation and £95 million being centrally held for transport issues during COVID-19. Sadly, Mr Speaker, there are fears among those 
that a new round of austerity may hit us after this crisis. However, if there are any lessons to be learned with regards to COVID-19 and 10 years of austerity, it's that real investment in our public services is what's needed so that we all can move forward. Thank you. I call Mr. Mervyn's story. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. And can I join those members of the House who have expressed their condolences, uh, first of all, to the Dalit family uh, on the sad passing of a member of this House, uh, Mr. John Dalit. And I offer my personal condolences to the family and also to his party at this loss. It is but a sad reminder to us all that there is but a step between us and death. And we do all well to remember the words of the Saviour when he said, Come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And there is a rest and a peace to be found in him, even in the midst of crisis and in the midst of turmoil. Mr. Deputy Speaker, can I declare an interest as a member of the Northern Ireland Policing Board, as my comments will be, found, will be focused in relation to the settlement uh, in regards to the Department of Justice and to the Police Service of Northern Ireland. It is d uh, disappointing, Mr Deputy Speaker, that we come to this House four years uh, to have this budget presented to us, when the last budget that was presented in this House was presented by myself in 2016-17. And the reason for that, Mr Deputy Speaker, was because the party opposite, who now hold the position of the Ministry of Finance, decided for political reasons nothing else to walk away, not worrying about the medical school, not worrying about the poor, not worrying about the unemployed, not worrying about children, not worrying about education, but for purely political reasons they ran away. Members don't be under any illusion if they thought it was politically expedient to do it, they would do it again. Because what drives them is not the care for the poor and the, and the oppressed, it is their political ideology. And shame on the party opposite that it took four years for them then to come back to this House after they had got more concessions from the Treasury. Of course, let's remember, and I listen with, to all the members about Tory austerity. What oh, are the big bad Tories? Well, look at this page number seven in the budget document. And maybe figures don't mean much to the members opposite, but 85% of the block grant makes up the budget. Where does that come from? Does that come from the Irish Republic? Does it come from Europe? Does it come from fiscal policies that we have here? No, it comes from the very place that the members opposite criticise, and they never can miss an opportunity. No thankfulness, no gratitude, but just give us more. Yes, I'll give way. I invite the member. He seems to have an interesting conception of how the Northern Ireland's fiscal position works. Would he recognise that people here pay taxes for public services that, by law and without any choice, has to go to the Exchequer in London? And the constitution means that it comes back here. That's, that's not a choice anyone here has. Thank the member. And I was going to commend the member for the way in which he presented his comments earlier in relation to setting, I think, a very balanced approach, maybe more balanced than mine, in relation to the budget. So I think, and he makes a valid point. Yes, we do pay our taxes. But if we're depending on us only paying our taxes, remember there is an almost 10 billion deficit that's made up by the exchequer. Let's not cut off the hand that feeds us and let's have a little bit of gratitude. But I'm sure that will be lost on the members opposite who will find some other political imagination to uh, have a go at the British Government. While on the face of it, Mr Deputy Speaker, the settlement in regards to the Department of Justice has a 6.3 increase, I think, and that would equate to something around 3 per cent for the Police Service of Northern Ireland. In real terms, it is a standstill budget and is a flat budget in regards to what is being uh, provided to deliver for the police service. And let's remember, our police service are the most scrutinised, the most looked at, the most observed, the most changed, and they have all of these other things that they have to 
do, along with, provide for us all a peaceful and a safe community. And so some of the pressures, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker, that the police service are under are issues like lit uh, legacy litigation, compensation, holiday pay, injury and wards, estates, body armour, human resources, technology, and the list goes on and on. There was a gap, a funding gap, of £58 million. Now, as a result of, and again, I can't criticise the party opposite for being all grateful and then not be grateful myself, the Department of Justice in-house did provide an additional £23 million to the police service of Northern Ireland, and that is welcome. But the reality is that there still remains a challenge. But yet we have seen over this COVID crisis a demand particularly and sadly in regards to the rise in domestic abuse and shame on those who would engage in such a vile thing in our society. And the resources, for example, last week this House debated the domestic abuse bill. Where are the additional resources going to be found to ensure that the police have the adequate resources to be able to deliver that. Let's remember that the Audit Office also gave us a report last week which indicated that £200 million over 10 years had been taken from the police budget. That would equate, if they had solely delivered a reduction on headcount of some 4,000 officers. That's why, Mr Speaker, I want to conclude with one comment in regards to what's in this, this bill, this uh, budget. The Minister has allocated, and my colleague has spoken in regards to the need for the health provision in the maiden city of Londonderry and, and the medical school of 15 million. But also in the new decade, new approach, there was a commitment to increase the number of police officers to 7,500. And I would like to ask the Minister to answer to me and this House today where that money is, what has happened to the Barnet Consequential in relation to the additional 20,000 officers that was given by uh, the, announced by the Prime Minister, and where are we at in regards to giving to the Police Service of Northern Ireland those additional officers? Because this cannot just be uh, one side gets what was agreed and another side and the other part of the agreement is left for six months, six years. We won't wait. If it's a deal, then we do them both together or we don't do them at all. I wait for the answer, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker, of the, the Finance Minister this afternoon. Thank you. I call Mr Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I want to thank the Minister and the Department, his Department, for all the hard work that they have done at this time. I recognise the difficulties of working from home, the pressures and the anxiety over this pandemic. And like my colleague from North Antrim, uh, yes, we have all seen that rise in domestic violence and the cries for help coming through into our office. But uh, we and I in Lisburn know the great work that the PSNI are doing. And uh, I think uh, just to put that on record in order to try and see where we possibly can come out of this on the other end. Uh, again, I want to thank the Minister for what he has already announced regarding COVID. And I see here the fishery support, the discretionary payments, the community support scheme, direct payments to families, the school meals, small business grants business rates, holidays, COVID-19 pressures and the help that's come from that. I think this budget represents about 10 per cent of that, I'm not sure, but and the prison service and the storage. Uh, it is understandable that the measures have to be very blunt to get so many people as possible, and it's impossible to cover everyone here right away. However, now that we are a few weeks further down the line, those people that have been left behind by these measures must be considered, Minister. Industrial derating, manufacturing, SMEs. I thank the Minister for making the 10 grants available for those with industrial premises below an NAV of 15,000, but we must look at those that have larger premises. There's nothing for them. 
and I know the fear that's in these business people because they ring me and they ring us all, and they want and they want to be there. And the one thing that any of them needs is that certainty. The certainty is not given to them, and they're facing a cliff edge at the moment. And if these businesses go down, they're not coming back, folks. My sister, I said earlier. Uh, rang me last night, and she has a pub in Belfast herself and her husband. A good bar, a good central located bar, and they are finding it tough. They are finding it very difficult, and they do not know what the future holds for them. These are, as I say, are not large, huge, big businesses, but small, family-owned SMEs that are the backbone of the Northern Ireland economy. Example one is the small businesses, and another one that rang me in Lisburn that has outgoings of £8,500 per month with no income. Businesses with multiple locations in England, these companies can get a grant for each of their premises. Why is this not something similar that we have here in Northern Ireland? This is not a criticism. As I say, I know the pressures, that, and I am trying my best to see the pressures that the Minister and his department is under, but it is a cry from help, because I'm getting that cry as the rest of us are getting it and feeling it in here. Business people aren't afraid of hard work, folks. We all know that. They go into the uncertainty, they take the risks, and they're the risk takers in our community, and they're the ones that are going to drive this economy on when we get out of it. Uh, Small freight companies owned not by big companies again. They make their money from the goods they can bring back and forth from trips to England and continental Europe. What help is there for them? Students. No mention of help for students. I I welcome the increase in the Student Hardship Fund, but this is not enough. Students already in debt due to large tuition fees are really struggling at the moment with no way to earn extra money. Everything is closed. Some are still tied into rental agreements for properties they are not using. How can we support them? Hospitality. Uh, this is an area that I know myself, and I have spoken there a little bit on it. Look, these, these are small businesses that people have grown. They, their lives are put into it. They are proud of the businesses that they do. Um, when I think of the troubles and the ending of the troubles and the package and the prosperity that come from the tourism that started to flood into Belfast and all parts of Northern Ireland. And that growth, it was very slow, but it came. And the front line, when those people come in, it was in the small hotels or in the bars or in the restaurants or the coffee shops that they got the best asset that we have in Northern Ireland. And that's our people, folks. And we have an asset there which is second to none, but they need the tools. They just cannot be expected to fight this battle without a little bit of help coming to them. They need it. What we have at the moment is good, and I recognise and I thank the Minister and I thank his department, but there is more needed. I just want to um, say on the current rent rates and licensing system, it makes it impossible for a business to sustain at these low levels. Hospitality is an area that Northern Holland has been able to grow in recent years. The Minister needs to consider the measures urgently, or the business we see today will no longer and they won't be here, and they're not coming back. And I just want to finish it, I just have a few seconds, that the, my sister was born above a pub. And she has reared her family in that. I'm only using that as one example here. This is gone. They don't want it to go. They want to work. And the main thing here, folks, is they did not ask to be. They were asked to close. They had a viable business that worked hard for it. And we need to be sure that we can help them to sustain this business and grow Northern Ireland. I am proud of Northern Ireland. I'm proud of the people in Northern Ireland. I'm proud of the support that I got through difficult times working behind a ring of steel in Belfast. We need to step up to the plate here again, folks, because it's now worse than that. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I call Ms Paula Bradshaw. Um, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I'd just like to um, extend my sympathies to the Dalit family as well. I have met him a few times and I always find him incredibly charming and very polite and courteous. I rise on behalf of the Alliance Party and will be focusing my comments on health spending. 
Only a few short months ago, with the re-establishment of the executive, we were all full of hope that the statutory committees would refill the three-year void in terms of accountability and transparency around all aspects of our devolved administration, not least with regards to finance. It was deeply frustrating for me, as the Alliance Party Health spokesperson, that the much healed health transformation agenda, which was launched in October 2016, had been taken forward during that hiatus exclusively by civil servants in a manner they neither sought nor desired, and that associated decisions in terms of priority and then the allocation of previous years of the confidence and supply funding were being taken without scrutiny by the representatives of those elected here from across our community. I am pleased, therefore, that the Finance Department has received an assurance from the Treasury that the 12, sorry, £10 million for mental health will be available within this year, something that I am sure we all feel is very important as we move through and beyond this pandemic. So this January, not only was the Health Committee to be re-established, but we had the new decade, new approach deal to focus our energies on delivering for Northern Ireland, a deal that contained many commitments and many proposals for much-needed change. Among these commitments, there were certainly very, very high priorities around dealing with waiting lists, reform of adult social care, the mental health strategy, palliative end-of-life care, three funded cycles of IVF, and the new strategic direction for drugs and alcohol. Very quickly, however, it became apparent that the financial requirements for their implementation were not going to be met to the level that is required. And so departmental officials have been faced with the issue of identifying and allocating funding to try to meet these commitments, while also dealing with other inescapable pressures across our health workforce, work streams and workplaces. Then, just as the benefit of ministerial and executive direction was beginning to give clear guidance in terms of political priorities, the threat and then the reality of COVID-19 refocused minds and activity. I would credit the Health Minister for his recent announcements outside the pandemic with reference to the first 300 undergraduate nursing and midwifery places, as well as the announcement around the mental health champion. However, the reality is that the wider health transformation agenda has again, unfortunately, been seriously disrupted and delayed, just at the moment that the very need for transformation has been demonstrated so clearly. Turning now to the, the COVID-19 pandemic, it has shown why structures, sorry, systems, not structures, is so important. It has no doubt thrown all financial planning for this current year into some disarray. It is worrying, therefore, that the allocation to date of £205 million to the Department of Health for, le for meeting the challenges of the coronavirus, despite its template response identifying that it will need between 508 to 588 million of additional costs. I appreciate that this figure does not include the centrally held fund of 150 million for PPE. However, there remains a significant chasm between estimates of cost and allocation. At this point, I would also want to raise the plights of charities and community and voluntary organisations who have continued to provide health and wellbeing support across a range of conditions during this health crisis. In the budget statement, it's, it highlights at pages 67 and 68 that the Health Department is responding and states that there is business support for voluntary and community sector and independent sector brackets, including hospices. During a call yesterday, um, some members of the House here were also involved in that, with CO3, the Forum for Chief Executives in the Third Sector, it would appear that details of this support are not yet forthcoming and it is leaving them in very precarious financial positions now and very much undermines their sustainability for the future. Uh, all the planning for the delivery of frontline services of individual transformation programmes and initiatives will now need to be significantly revised during this year, but that does not mean they are any less urgent. The impact on the reconfiguration of health and social care services on non-COVID-19 care and treatment is significant, as highlighted by the BMA just this week. It is clear that the response of the Department in dealing with, with COVID-19 was necessary to protect the public and those working in the health service. However, on the far side of this crisis, we need to give greater priority to catch up in terms of things like tackling our waiting lists. And in the medium short term, I am sure members share my concern for the many thousands of people who have found their appointments cancelled, their treatment delayed, and their ability to stay on their care pathway seriously disrupted. 
We will never be able to calculate the true cost of this pandemic, not just on those who so tragically lost their lives to the virus, but also on those whose operations and treatment has been indefinitely postponed and whose conditions have undoubtedly worsened. On the far side of the virus, the health service must be in a position not just to restore services, but to make up for lost ground and address further pressures. This means not only proceeding with the transformation process, but hastening, but hastening it. We have seen that changes in mode and place of working can take place in quick time, where there is strong focus, political backing, and we must maintain that. To do that, we must embrace the need to include our frontline workers, our allied health professionals, our charities and voluntary organisations, and the many representative bodies to have frank and realistic conversations about how best to meet the needs of our people urgently. We're running out of time here, so I'll move to the end. The Health Committee will have to play a pivotal role in monitoring in-year financial um, accounts to ensure that the reconfiguration process proposals going forward are robust and transparent and that any associated costs represent value for money and will produce the desired, desired improved health outcomes. In closing, I would like to place on record my appreciation for the work of those within the finance section of the Department of Health. 2019 was not an easy year, and it does not look like this financial year will be any easier. Thank you. Thank you. I call Mr William Irwin. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. <coughs> And can I pass my condolences on to uh, the Dalit family on the death uh, of on his passing today? I, can I say these are unprecedented times for the House and indeed for everyone in Northern Ireland? Whilst today we speak about finances on the 2021 budget, we must not forget the heavy impact coronavirus has had throughout the province, throughout the rest of the UK and indeed the Republic of Ireland, and indeed across the world. The health of our population is our major concern, and at this moment, uh, this is very much reflected in the budget report. At this stage, I want to put on record my gratitude to the nursing and care staff who live in the Newry and AMI constituency for their very brave and important work in our hospitals, nursing homes, care homes, paramedics, GP centres, and all other providers of health care. Words do not do justice to how important this work has been throughout this crisis. I also offer my deepest sympathy throughout thoughts and prayers to those families who have suffered bereavement due to the coronavirus. This has been an awful time for, the, for many families uh, and to have suffered loss at this time. Focusing on the issue before us in the House today, the budgetary positions are, some, are somewhat altered due to the virus pandemic and the measures that have been put in place to help mitigate the worst effects. And I think in this House today, we are all aware of this reality. Uh, as the focus of our Assembly continues to be on the response of the virus across our hospitals, testing sites, and indeed, the First and Deputy First Minister continue to chart a course through this pandemic, pandemic. It is important that we also focus on the wheels of government and the fact that departments must continue to operate to support not only the health and well-being of Northern Ireland, but the social and economic well-being of Northern Ireland as well. I do very much welcome the significant support mechanisms that have been put in place by the Westminster Government to assist the public, and I also welcome the role out of this very vital and support for people in Northern Ireland through our departments within the Executive. I am sure, like most representatives, we have been contacted by those for, who, for various reasons, are missing out on vital assistance. I know that work by our Executive is continuing to try and make assistance available to as great a number as possible. This work has not been easy, and I do commend our executive and department staff working under huge time pressure and indeed under the pressure of a real and concerning virus risk to get schemes up and running and, and for already making thousands of payments to businesses across Northern Ireland. In terms of DERA and allocation to the department, I welcome the progress of the budget from an agri-food and environmental perspective. Indeed, in regards to the environment, you cannot fail to be struck by reports how circulating in the issues on the issue of improvements in air quality levels and pollution during the current lockdown. I have been amazed at the pictures of large cities with the, own, with the usual haze of smog above them. This is a very real and stark reminder to the impact of, of industry in modern day, day to day living to our environment. 
The budget makes mention in the report specifically in regard to the era in promoting and sustainability of our agri-food sectors, and also the protection and enhancement of the environment. It must be said again, uh, as I have said before in the House, that farmers and their daily work make a massive contribution to both sustaining our food supply network, which, is, which has been commendable during the period of great crisis and uncertainty, and also for caring for the environment and maintaining thousands of acres of land across the province. Food supply has certainly been the, to the forefront in recent times, and the panic buying through the broad pressure on our producers, processors and retailers it has been very evident that our network work well under an immense pressure. Thankfully, these pressures have subsided somewhat at the moment. With our agri-food sector amounting to five billion in turnover and supporting over 100,000 jobs, this is an important sector to the future post-Brexit and indeed post-coronavirus. Whilst we are looking closely at measures and methods uh, of supporting this industry post-Brexit, we also now have to look at ways to ensure that our farmers receive support to weather this current virus storm. This has added an extra layer of complexity, and I know that uh, the Minister, my colleague Edwin Poots, is acutely aware of this and is actively and progressively doing what he can to mitigate these challenges along with his executive colleagues. As I have said before, foreign support and direct payments totalling to £278 million is very welcome and provides an important level of support and assurance that agri-food will continue to be supported as the finer details of future support are tied down. I, su I suspect that these discussions could be delayed somewhat given the necessity of focusing on the coronavirus. However, the main, the remain, I remain eager and ready to represent the voice of the farmer in the dis these discussions that will come down the line on this issue. These are unprecedented times, and I support the paper before the House today and look forward to brighter days ahead when the House is able to return to full capacity. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I call Ms. Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Firstly, can I pay my respects to my colleague and very dear friend, uh, John Dallet, and my heartfelt condolences to Anne, his wife, and his much loved family, who he constantly talked about, um, and also to my colleagues, because it is a great loss for us in the SDLP family. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I rise before you as the economy spokesperson for the SDLP. It's almost surreal to be discussing a budget under the shadow of COVID-19. As other members have said, it has been absolutely impossible to adequately scrutinise this budget, as we are trying to do so in an evolving health and economic crisis. And at this point, can I commend my colleagues uh, present here um, in relation to the comments that they made about looking at our fiscal powers and looking at our borrowing and the passionate plea uh, by the member of Lagan Valley for more COVID-19 support, particularly for the hospitality uh, and tourism industry. It is really important. There's a lot of distress out there. These are extraordinary times which require extraordinary responses. Yet the challenges and priorities we face today are essentially the same as we were facing before this pandemic, albeit there is greater urgency. And they are health, skills, infrastructure and climate change. Northern Ireland's National Health Service has shown amazing capacity for resilience and its ability to reform its structure and to do it quickly during this emergency. That approach needs to be built upon, and it needs to be built in its DNA with urgent implementation of the reforms outlined in the Bengoa Review. Those investments have to be backed by greater investment in training a new generation of professionals, and I too welcome the recent announcement on the expansion of the training provision of nurses. But we must make very, very urgent progress in approving the Graduate Entry Medical School in McGee. This is an absolute demand and priority for the SDLP, which is why we successfully insisted that it be included in the new decade, new approach agreement. 
Our commitment to skills. No, sorry. Thanks. Our commitment to skills goes beyond that. As we emerge from the worst of the COVID-19 crisis, we will need to cons consistently uh, and constantly evaluate our approach to skills. Let us be clear: we need to step up on our output, both of graduates with the relevant skills and of our vocational training programmes for our workforce, for our workforce and our future workforce across the entire age range of our existing workers and our potential workers. That means we have to get the 14 to 19 year old skills strategy absolutely right. I am really concerned about the situation facing our young adults and teenagers. What future are, we, are they facing? My generation has failed them in terms of the environment and climate crisis we are giving them as a legacy. Will we now also leave them an economy that fails them? For all the talk of COVID-19 and of us all being in this together, it's simply not true. The risk is that it increases division. The division between those who can work at home, who have a well-paid income, and those who can't. I'm thinking of the vulnerable, insecure workers, the cleaners, the delivery riders, the taxi drivers, those are the people that we have a special duty of care towards. It is those pupils who leave school without the best grades or qualifications who risk a future in that gig economy in which they will struggle to survive and struggle to earn. Let us make sure we do not fail them. So far as our party's economy spokes so far as our party's economy spokesperson, I have spoken about health and about education, yet I'm still talking about the economy. That is because these issues span the departments and span the responsibilities of individual ministers. And that is why I would urge the executive ministers to work together. And I know that I speak for my minister, uh, Nicola Mallon, when I say that our party is absolutely committed to joint working, to make this place a better place, and I urge all ministers to do the same. And that brings me to another urgent priority, and that's infrastructure. We are probably, and here probably the number one priority for our society is to withstand the current and perhaps future isolation lockdowns to ensure that we have the right telecommunications, broadband and electricity infrastructure while enable us to reduce carbon emissions. The lead department for this is economy and broadband is absolutely essential for getting our economy right. We need to work closely with the private sector to ensure that we get the fast possible deployment of the fastest possible broadband. If we fail to do this, and we are already miles behind other countries, then we are placing our economy at the back of the pack. We need to respond to these extraordinary times with the flexibility to adjust our spending programmes to focus on the emerging priorities, which are ramping up performance in health provision, increasing our skills, output and investing in the necessary infrastructure. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, to do this we will require ministers of Northern Ireland to work like never before and they must work together and I urge them to do so. Thank you. Thank you. I call Mr Jim Allister. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, these are challenging and difficult times and so they will continue, I fear, because on the other side of COVID-19, the um, fiscal commitments which have been made uh, will have to be paid for. And the economy that whatever shape it emerges in, it will be indisputably weaker uh, than it entered this crisis. And therefore facing into that, it is a comfort to any thinking person to know that at our back, we have a major country, the United Kingdom, uh, with a leading role in the world's economy and with opportunities and reserves far greater than many lesser countries. And therefore, 
uh, as Her Majesty's Minister for Finance here uh, continues to spend the money uh, sent from the Treasury. And as we look forward to um, playing our part as part of that nation in picking up this economy hereafter, then we do have the comfort of knowing that far from chasing the rainbows of some fantasies, constitutional or otherwise, we are part of a solid, reliable economy. And that's a good place to be in terms of the difficulties such as we are facing. In the last budget debate, we had a discussion about the fiscal deficit. And the minister tried to diminish the fiscal deficit, tried to talk down the amount of money that we get in the block grant, and took refuge in all sorts of inexplicable uh, obfuscations to minimise it. I'm therefore glad that today, in his budget document, at paragraph 2.3, there is this emphatic and unmistakable statement. This is a document in which the minister writes the foreword, of course. It is his budget document. And it says, the taxes generated within Northern Ireland are considerably less than the level of funding received from Her Majesty's Treasury. This shortfall is known as the fiscal deficit. Considerably less. That's the reality that I and other members were talking about in the last budget debate and the reality that the Minister was seeking to deny. I'm glad, therefore, it's down in black and white in his own document today. And speaking of chapter 2 of this document, could I draw the House's attention to the very next paragraph? The most important point to note is that all Dell allocations, frequently referred to as the Northern Ireland Block Grant, are made on the basis of a clear separation between resource and capital. That paragraph is plain wrong. It is wholly misleading and just factually inaccurate to say that Dale allocations are frequently referred to as the block grant. The block grant, as surely we should know, is Dale plus Amy. The block grant is cash. The block grant in tables one and two, etc., in the annex is the Dell and the um, the Emmy. It's not a mere 12 or 14 million, as the um, Dell tables show. Indeed, go to the current Treasury publication of the United Kingdom estimates. Look at page 424. And you will see that the estimated block grant, the payment into the Northern Ireland Consolidated Fund for this year is £22.6 billion. That's what the block grant is. It's not just Dell. And I, I must say I'm astounded that a department would produce a document which contains such a misleading assertion that the Dale allocations are frequently referred to as the block grant. Say it again, that's just wrong. Why is it here? This block grant is Dale plus Amy. So I would like the Minister to explain why uh, the uh, matter is so misdescribed in paragraph 2.4. This is not just some flippant document dashed off uh, for someone's entertainment. This is the budget document. This is supposed to be accurate and complete. So why is it misleading in paragraph 2.4? Can I ask a few other questions out of that document? 
Paragraphs 236 to 38 talk about the confidence in supply, and I've, I'll confess I've almost lost track of all this, but can I simply ask the Minister, has all the confidence and supply money which was previously promised now been paid or promised to be paid, or is there still a shortfall in that regard? On New Decade, New Approach, paragraph 234, the budget document sets out various amounts of money, the total $523 million that seems to be coming. The Minister previously said, if I recall correctly, that the figure that should have been coming from New Decade, New Approach, was £740 million. Pounds. So, is, which is the up-to-date figure in that regard? And finally, I once asked a question of the Minister number 238 about what efficiencies would be required from departments. And he answered that question by saying uh, that we can, when we came to the allocations Mr. to various departments. I'm sorry, Mr. Officer, I did show a bit of leeway, but we're now sorry. S seven yeah. and a half minutes. Come well, I, I very much apologise. I would simply ask <laughs> that at some point the Minister would give an update to the answer to the question 238. Of 1722. That was a very sincere apology. Um, <laughs> call Miss Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I also express condolences to the family, friends, and colleagues of Mr. John Dallet today? As I stated the last time I commented on the budget in this chamber, we need a comprehensive, adequate process with real time for scrutiny. Notwithstanding the difficult circumstances that we find ourselves in, we are still in the same position as we found ourselves in in February. We do not have any of the detail. The executive talks of a new decade and of a new approach, but this is more of the same old. As the chair of the committee, uh, the Justice Committee has already outlined, the committee had a short period of time to examine the department's budget. I find it difficult to scrutinise the proposals due to the absence of estimated costs and lack of detailed information on funding for various parts of the department and other bodies. The scale of the costs for COVID-19 had not been supplied. The funding, for, the funding gap for the PSNI has not been met, and there was no indicative costs for the new decade new approach commitments. We do not know the extent to which slippage will shape the departmental budget, what the impact will be, or what the reprioritization by the minister will look like. In the case of Brexit, an appraisal is apparent, apparent forgotten issue at the time. We are told that a separate exercise is to be carried out by the Department of Finance to address funding gaps. But this just shows an overarching wait and see approach. This is not how, this is not how budget should be planned. It is not how public money should be spent. And it is not a good example of governments. Greater transparency is needed in order for us to see what avenues departments are going down to ensure that this is effective and for all, also for us to actually scrutinise what is going on. So I look forward to additional time in committee to scrutinise this process. Moving on, I will not repeat all the issues that I have raised before in this chamber, many of which should be, be addressed by this budget but are not sufficiently, including local council funding, the hospitality industry, housing, actual adequate resources to tackle climate breakdown and our ecological crisis, the need for an independent environmental protection agency that this House committed to. I would agree with Mr Frew's comments earlier on. This budget will be the subject to change, but I will be arguing that it must change. What I do want to ask is a very simple question. Are we prepared for what is coming? And is this budget sufficient? Will this shape the aftermath of COVID? We know about the businesses and people that are falling through the cracks. We know that we are staring into the face of another economic recession, estimated between 6.7 and 10% contracting for Northern Ireland alone. So how are we going to tackle that? It is certainly not through the ma matching city deal money, which is not new, already committed by Westminster, with a focus solely on GVA. GVA means nothing when there is no food on the table or living in fuel, fuel poverty in a freezing house. The pandemic and lockdown has laid bare the precariousness of many people's livelihoods, the plight of the self-employed, those on inadequate contracts, the pay and conditions of our essential workers, basically those that we really need the most. Inequalities are more, the, more apparent than ever. Landlords are given mortgage holidays, while those who rent struggle to pay their bills. Those from lower income backgrounds are disproportionately suffering because of health inequalities. Children who, because their family cannot afford the additional equipment, disproportionately affected by the closure of schools, which could have lasting effects on their learning and future prospects, and today announced over 2 million children experiencing food poverty in the UK since lockdown. 
COVID is certainly not the great leveller, as has been described. The last opportunity that we had when there was growing momentum for change was after the financial crash in 2008. But instead of tackling inequalities and bailing out our people, those in power decided to bail out the banks and deepen disadvantage through crippling cuts to public services in the age of austerity. We cannot return to the old way of doing things. In the context of a global health emergency, some governments around the world have bailed out workers. Some are introducing a minimum vital income. The pandemic, its effects and the response are consistently referred to in warlike terms. And we know the need to reduce poverty and boost the economy after World War II led to the foundations of the modern day welfare state. So far, we've missed a glaring opportunity to introduce a universal basic income that would go in some way to address the many inequalities and pave the way for a just recovery from the global health emergency. Whilst I welcome the political parties joining our call for a UBI, there has been no action. There should be no return to business as usual. The new normal must incorporate some of the things that we're all witnessing around us now. Things that just a few months ago seemed almost impossible to achieve, and the state must be able to meet these challenges. Why has it taken a pandemic to result in positive environmental indicators? That we now have better air quality should not be seen as some silver lining to the crisis. It should be something that we as citizens demand moving forward into recovery and beyond. Instead of return to the roads, resuming the daily commute, sitting in private cars on our own and complaining about parking spaces, we should be thinking about more flexible working patterns, the conditions and serious investment and provision of public transport and active travel. So how do we measure success? Is it through economic growth or should we have other priorities in health outcomes, education, justice and the environment? Why is there always money for war but never enough for health and education? We need to look at other criteria for measuring the success of our communities and societies to be met with nurturing and resourcing in the interests of the public good. Not narrow macroeconomic objectives, but community and social objectives. GDP obsession and perpetual capitalist growth to some unknown destination is no longer the dish of the day. And at the heart of this is the need for a true green just recovery and the basis for our future, future development model. Now is the time to develop a new sustainable economy as part of a fair and just recovery, so new jobs are created in an ethical and environmentally friendly way. This can be achieved through a just transition and Green New Deal, which all of the executive parties supported in previous mandates and manifestos, but unsurprisingly is not here today. A green recovery presents us with a short and long-term vision of sustainable jobs for life, with simultaneous improvements socially, environmentally and economically. It's not about getting back to business as usual, to a world where many struggle to get by, and it will address the fundamental problems that this pandemic has brought to us on the surface, the valuation of the workforce, what is valued as key, or in crude Brexit terms, skilled. As a colleague of mine has been arguing, it is not the currency speculators that are important for the functioning of our society when it is stripped back to the essentials. It is the nurses, the carers, the posties, the bus drivers, the refuse collectors, the prison officers, the police, funeral directors, shelf stackers, those keeping the lights on, the water running, the teachers, those work, who work in our refuges, our homeless shelters and the community and voluntary agency. The list goes on. What is missing from this budget, Mr Deputy Speaker, are the very options that we need to have in order to answer the fundamental question I have raised. What kind of world do we want to get back to? What this does do yet again is put the sign up on our door saying normal business as usual. This cannot and will not be the case. We need to build back better and reimagine a society that works for everyone. Thank you. I call Mr Jerry Carroll. On record, my condolences and sympathies to uh, Mr. Dalit uh, and his family uh, and his um, uh, party colleagues. There's, um, there's no escaping that we're in the throes of a, of a global health pandemic and veering into a deep recession as we consider this budget. Uh, the period ahead may be filled with massive uncertainty, but one truth rings clear as a bell. We cannot return to the normality which gave rise to this crisis. No return to normal. This sentiment has been felt and expressed right around the globe, unsurprisingly felt most strongly by those at the bottom of society who feel the outworkings of this pandemic most sharply. No return to our nurses standing in the freezing cold for months for the pay they deserve. No more systematic underfunding of our health service until it is perpetually at the brink and underprepared for whatever crisis is around the corner. No more food production based on bottom prices and agri-food competition. 
which pumps our food full of antibiotics giving rise to new and resistant viruses and destroying the environment to the tune of millions of tonnes of carbon. Summed up, it is a fundamental break uh, with an economic system which gives primacy, primacy above all else to the market uh, and breeds through competition. The very duo which sees nations around the world struggle for basic orders of PPE, including the Finance Minister here today, apparently. This emergency shows that we need emergency action, which goes beyond treating the current pandemic. This budget, I am afraid, does nothing of the sort, nor does it, does it try to. There is no ambition for a different kind of economic agenda. And in my role as one of the very few opposition MLAs, Mr Deputy Speaker, I will do my best to scrutinise it here today, although I share other sentiments that it has been hard to scrutinise over the last few days. And it's bizarre in the extreme, Mr Deputy Speaker, to hear committee chair after committee chair raise concerns, many of them which I would concur with, but seemingly many of them will probably vote for this uh, budget bill uh, regardless. If we look at health, primarily the big parties in this executive have spent years implementing Tory cuts to our NHS. This had a very real impact during this crisis, with too few ventilators, ICU beds, too little PPE, and without the capacity to properly test as well. We have been forced to play catch-up uh, all along while the virus has spread. And one might hope there was a lesson here, uh, but looking through the fine detail of these budget project projections, it is clear that nothing uh, has been learned. Much is made of a 6 per cent bump for the health budget, which certainly would be promising if it were not for inflation and the fact that we are all living longer, adding to the cost of the health service, which means this is not really a 6 per cent bump increase at all. It is not a significant increase in real terms. If anything, it is a repeat of similar baseline austerity budgets with savings at the heart of it. Indeed, as I pointed out on the Health Committee, these projections are predicated on at least a £50 million cut to health trusts across the region, £50 million from our health service stripped away during a global health pandemic. But uh, that figure was not the headline, unlike the supposed 6 per cent bump. And while communities are out clapping for the NHS every Thursday, uh, some elected reps are, are suggesting £50 million cuts in the health service. It would be unbelievable if it were not so true to form. Uh, and sticking with health, this budget guarantees a continuation of the logic of the Bengoa report which itself is predicated on efficiencies and savings rather than the massive investment needed in our health service. Clearly, the strong warnings about such an agenda by unions and health workers have fallen on deaf ears. I do not look forward, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, to future sittings of this Assembly where we look back at the ruinous impact of such a strategy, but I fear that uh, that will indeed uh, come to pass. And finally, where is the commitment to double funding for mental health, a basic demand which mental health workers say will we'll have a massive difference. The increase in depression and anxiety that isolation has brought should have given impetus to act uh, on this issue. Once again, mental health has been relegated. Moving on to the other crisis which faces us, climate change. It is often said, Mr Deputy Speaker, by environmental activists that this Assembly is addicted to roads. And you look at the Department for Infrastructure figures, this budget will not prove them wrong. £75 million for the new A5. War is the budget for rectifying the additional air pollution this will cause. Air pollution which kills one in 24 people uh, in this city, in Belfast alone. Nor is there a reference to rectifying the air pollution likely to come from the York Street interchange. Nor, and this is stark, is there a massive increase in investment for Translink, who just uh, months ago warned that our public transport system would collapse without additional funding. Where is that funding? A break with individual cars will not come without a proper alternative, but this budget does not provide one. And instead of sustainable uh, funding for Translink, we have seen suggestions from the Finance Minister for further austerity, which requests the Translink staff should be furloughed in order to deal with this crisis. This suggestion of further austerity will only make situation, the situation worse, and obviously the Committee Chair has raised concerns about Translink uh, going, going forward. To move on to the Department for Agriculture, Mr Deputy Speaker, there is no attempt to intervene to create a food production sector which shirks competition in favour of health and sustainability for us who eat the food and for those who produce it. This will be vital in the challenge, uh, in the challenge around the global climate crisis. We see a reflection uh, of previous austerity budgets in the Department for Finance, and I quote, improve effectiveness across the public sector by transforming the civil service, it reads. We all know what that is called. For. It's uh, the same tale spun to us when the voluntary exit scheme saw 20,000 secure unionised jobs offered up on the chopping block. The result today 
Most of these jobs were replaced by agency staff on precarious contracts, unable to join a union, encroaching privatisation, and a massive bill for rec recruitment agencies as well. And what has been done to the civil service in the name of effectiveness under the previous executive is a neoliberal dream and a workers' nightmare. Again, either lessons have not been learned, or this new executive is just as neoliberal as the last one. Finally, two measures relating to uh, COVID-19 uh, mentioned in the budget. For me, the standout figure was £99 million for businesses. Undoubtedly, small businesses need support uh, during this crisis, but just as necessary was a large injection of financial aid for individuals thrust into poverty and unemployment. The economist Michael Roberts has noted this trend uh, right across Europe, state aid, for, state aid for businesses at around four times that for ordinary people, though it is notable that in comparison even to other governments, we have given out much less. And on the question of rates, for example, I don't oppose freezing the domestic rate and reducing the regional rate to help struggling small businesses. But in my view, this executive must, must go much further, and workers and families should also see their rate uh, payments cut. Um, I think there is a question around the priorities. Mr Carroll, we are beyond seven minutes. Thank you. I will continue to scrutinise this budget. Thank you very much, Mr <laughs> Deputy Speaker. Dead on. We will read it on the website. Mr McNulty. Last can call it. And can I begin by sharing the um, sharing, sharing with other members of this uh, assembly and passing on my sincere condolences to the family of my esteemed colleague John Dallas. Um, John, to me, epitomises the size of the fight in the man as opposed to the size of the man in the fight. He was a warrior for, for peace, a warrior for justice, and a warrior for social democracy, and he will be very greatly missed. Mr Speaker, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak in this debate today. We are in uncertain times, and as many fellow members have already alluded to, this is no ordinary budget. The Minister has also indicated that this will need reviewed in just a few weeks' time, so that makes today's debate both important and yet at the same time almost futile. Our public finances have, been faced, have never faced so much pressure and demand, and given that reality, there is also much uncertainty and a lack of, normal, of a normal scrutiny process. I want to make my contributions as a member of the Education Committee and then as a constituency MLA. Last count, Corla, we heard today from the Finance Minister of the real term increase in the budget. However, our, com our, com our committees have heard from both the Minister and the Permanent Secretary about the real pressures faced by the, the, the Department, £165 million in revenue spend and additional pressure going forward for £200 million. This budget still does not address areas such as the unacceptable backlog in, in the school maintenance programme, estimated to be in the region of £400 million. Our children are often being taught in substandard accommodation and school leaders are crying out for capital investment and maintenance. Any initiatives cannot and should not be allowed to be derailed, and the ongoing work to reform and reboot the area of special educational needs and mental health support in schools must not be derailed also. And this budget does not take into account the new normality our schools will face when children return to classrooms. It does not meet the need for, for support to adopt classrooms, both physically and the resources needed for what may come down the line. The Committee Chair has also referred to the commitments made in the New Decade and New Approach Agreement. Again, the Budget makes no provision for these commitments. I believe it is important we are honest with the public in the time ahead about commitments made and what will be honoured. Last Concordia, I now speak as a constituency MLA. There is lots of talk about doing things different post-pandemic, but this needs to be demonstrated in the Budget and at any review stage of the budget. I fear we will soon transition from doing things differently back to plugging the funding gap. I fear we will just be doing less rather than more. But we need to be ambitious for our economy and our society. An opportunity has presented itself to reboot our economy in a different way. I believe the key to our economy, our economic Recovery will be sustained capital investment and infrastructure programme across all departments. 
It will be key to getting our construction industry back to work, but will, it will have far-reaching impacts into all associated services and sectors, from suppliers to the corner shop. Of that infrastructure, we need to see commitments like the delivery of the Belfast Dublin High Speed Rail and Arley Enterprise Link delivered. We need to see investment in green, greenways and public transport and the delivery of broadband into every community if we are to really adopt to the new ways of living and working. We need to invest in and deliver more social housing and in open spaces and in, open spaces and in public parks. It's time to see the Albert, Park, Albert Basin Park in Newry delivered. We need the executive to step in and step up to, to support councils and public bodies who have seen their, their income decimated in the same way we have seen government step up to support some, some other businesses. There is much more to do in supporting those who have fallen through the cracks, from substitute teachers, cross-border workers, student renters, to the self-employed who need financial support, not just tea and sympathy. And that support needs to be timely. Too many of the pledges we hear take far too long to implement. It's also important we protect people from the harshest elements of welfare reform. Challenges faced long before COVID-19, like the bedroom tax. Although we still contend the best way to have done that would have been to have voted against it in the first place. I do welcome the extension of the mitigations but there are no mitigations to protect families from the ultra-draconian two-child rule, as this was only dreamed up by the Tories after the last executive handed power back to Westminster. Can the Minister say if money will be there to support, so to support the families affected? Minister, I could go on and on and on, but I won't. I urge you to think of those who have contacted every one of our constituency offices in the last few weeks, whilst we've been working in different working arrangements, our workloads, I'm sure you'll all agree, will have, has increased threefold. People are seeking help. They are fearful of what lies ahead for them in the future, and they want this executive and this assembly to listen and to act. Guru Mayo, to last Thank you. Um, before I call the Minister to wind on the debate, members will remember the Minister was allocated an hour. He used two minutes in opening the debate. Uh, I, I, once read, I once read that Gladstone once delivered a budget that took seven and a half hours. Um, I think the Minister has certainly smashed that record. Um, he has 58 minutes left of his hour. Um, I call the Minister, Mr Murphy. Gormar, I've got pre and uh, you'd be pleased to know I don't intend to take my 58 minutes. Uh, although I, I kind of get a sense of revenge for sitting through four hours of all the rest of you. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, I'd like to thank the members and the committee chairs for their participation in this debate. Uh, I thank those members who are supportive of the budget proposals for their input, and I listened with interest uh, to members who have spoken against the budget, though. As is always the case, I have heard demands for a litany of more expenditure and no uh, propositions for where, in a finite budget, then we are going to cut if we want to spend more in other areas. Uh, and it is quite often the case you will get a list of things that we should be spending money on, uh, but no suggestions as to where we should be taking that money from. Uh, but nonetheless, members are free to get up and make their points and write their statements accordingly. I intend to use uh, the remainder of my time to respond to a lot of the issues that have been raised, and I'll try and be as constructive uh, as possible. Uh, can I thank the committee chair for the, uh, from the Finance Committee for the committee's work in, in relation to this? Uh, he did raise an issue in relation to the further uh, vote of account that we will, we will need in the coming weeks, uh, and, and obviously there is a recognition from, I think, nearly all speakers that we are in very unique circumstances. We were in unique circumstances when we came back in January, and that has just uh, greatly multiplied uh, over the last number of weeks. Uh, and of course, that has then put a stress in terms of uh, some departments have had to spend much more than anticipated. Other departments are spending much less, uh, and that will make for a, a challenging June monitoring round. Uh, 
but I can assure you that the second voting account is not based on this 2021 budget. It will be based on a high percentage of the 2019-20 expenditure, and it is a technical approach to make sure that departments have the authority to spend uh, to continue to operate through this period when uh, this bill may not have completed its legislative passage. Uh, so uh, I think the, it, the, this is necessary because the time simply does not permit the production of a detailed main estimates document, and given the fast evolving COVID-19 situation and the spend associated with it, the budget may be out of date by the time the bill could be passed. So, of course, uh, we will engage with the committee in relation to that, and I will bring the main estimates along with a further budget bill to the Assembly in the autumn, uh, by which time we would hope that the financial position will have stabilised somewhat. Uh, but we do, certainly do need to ensure that the, uh, that the departments can continue to spend money. Uh, the Chair of the Communities Committee raised uh, the issue of additional funding for councils, uh, and I am aware that the Communities Minister is working with the councils to finalise pressures, and I expect to see a paper in relation to that. You need to bear, bear in mind that the £50 million Barnet consequential that came from England uh, applies to a different set of functions related to councils than it does here. Councils in England have functions in relation to social services, in relation to education, all of which we have had to spend money on here uh, uh, from our own budgets. Uh, so, of course, there will be a loss of revenue, and we recognise that to the councils, and uh, we, uh, we want to ensure that we, we support them how we can. But there also will be an opportunity for councils to save, as I said, in relation to the, I think, the rates debate earlier, uh, uh, quite a lot of issues the councils. Again, like ourselves, who had budgeted uh, anticipating a certain outcome this year, now I will not be able to spend money on that. And we look to the councils to, uh, in the first instance, look to themselves and see what savings can be found from that. Uh, sh she also raised the issue of capital funding for uh, Department for Communities and, and, and some uh, the issue around flexibility and, and certainty around all of that. And of course, uh, I have asked departments to look most acutely at, at capital spend pro, uh, projections, because uh, we have already lost f effectively the first quarter of this year. We may lose uh, a significant proportion of the second quarter of this year, uh, and we may not get the flexibility people might anticipate at the end of the financial year from Treasury. We would hope that we will, but there are no guarantees in relation to that. So, particularly in relation to capital budgets, uh, we have asked departments to look uh, to see uh, early what they think they can spend and what they may not be able to spend, and to try and work with us in relation to that. And I have to say it's a, it's a, a mixed bag in terms of, of, of the Department's response to that. I, I noted the, uh, the impassioned uh, opinion of the Chair of the Justice Committee, uh, who, who I think made the point very well from a committee perspective that they are, want to look to departments to play their part in ensuring that we do not end up uh, in the early part of next year, at the end of our financial year, surrendering significant proportions of money back to Treasury that people had held on to uh, in anticipation of spend that we weren't able to, uh, to spend. Yeah, well, sure. Way. Obviously, he has had, had some conversation with the Chief Secretary of the Treasurer, but could he confirm to the House that while many members come to this House and we talk aspirationally as to what we should do and so on, he has the power to write to the Chief Secretary of the Treasury and to set out in detail that particular issue around flexibility. Because if ever there was an opportunity now for us to make the argument in these circumstances that justified the flexibility, now is the time to do that. And will he commit to ensuring that that is the case, if he has not already done so? I can assure the, the member uh, that I have a weekly conversation with the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, and of course we, we do write to him as well. Uh, I have recently written to him on another issue, which I will raise shortly in relation to uh, uh, supply teachers. Uh, but yes, we have raised that, and yes, we get assurances. Uh, he will know that at the very tail end of the last financial year, the Treasury made an adjustment which forced us uh, into a readjustment of our capital budget, which thankfully we were able to carry over this year. But we have argued uh, that, that rather than uh, and give us Barnet consequences, which are above perhaps what they may be able to deliver, that we can get the baseline of that, so we don't end up having to readjust later in the year. And we have also argued for flexibility, but this is a very uncertain picture. Uh, and while I do welcome, and people have made that, I do welcome the interventions that have been from Treasury in relation to employee retention and in relation to support for uh, for uh, the self-employed. Uh, nonetheless, uh, there is no doubt the Treasury will be looking to recoup as much money as it can as the year goes on. Uh, and so, while we are asking and will press the case, and uh, the meetings I do with them 
uh, quite often joined by the Scottish Finance Minister and the Welsh Finance Minister, and we have very similar issues to raise with them. So there, it's not just a demand from here, uh, but also from other devolved areas. Uh, and we will continue to press that case because it's, it will be key in the time ahead. But I think departments need to help us out in the here and now in making sure we don't end up in a situation at the end of the year where we have a significant portion of money we're trying to, to, to uh, reallocate. Uh, just in relation to the sub-teachers, yeah, that is another issue. The, the, uh, can I just say in relation to that, I mean, the, uh, so, and people will understand this, and certainly the member who last spoke and, and other members who have been here a longer time, when, when a range of bids come in from departments and the executive uh, have a, a limited amount of funding, and we agree how that funding will be allocated, we also agree then the funding that's not allocated. Uh, and so the, the bid in relation to supply teachers was not supported. Uh, because we had a limited and uh, priorities went to other areas. That means the executive also agreed not to, uh, to put money into that at, at this time. Uh, now, since that, I have had uh, several discussions with the uh, education minister, because I do recognise uh, a number of speakers have mentioned the issue of supply teachers and sub-teachers. I do recognise, and we put the case very firmly to the Treasury, that while people in England and Scotland and Wales, uh, supply teachers normally come from an agency, uh, and therefore that agency could have them furloughed. Uh, here they come in a very random fashion off a list, which so are essentially very much self-employed, uh, and that they don't have that, that uh, overarching organisation which can bid for furlough on their behalf. Uh, and so we have pressed that case, and we're continuing to press that case. Both myself and the Education Minister wrote to the Treasury, and I raised it over the course of two meetings, including last Thursday with the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, and we're awaiting a response to that. So we have not forgotten the issue. We'll continue to press for that. Uh, a, a, in, uh, in relation to trying to get some support uh, from that. I think the, the Chair of the Education Committee, uh, Chris Little, raised the issue of uh, capital funding uh, from the shared uh, in, and integrated education fund, the Fresh Start uh, funding, and there has been uh, 36 million provided mm -hmm. to education for shared and integrated, integrated education in 2021. And we're in discussion again with the Treasury in relation to profile uh, of money for uh, future years. Uh, the Chair of the uh, Infrastructure Committee raised uh, several issues, uh, particularly in relation to Translink, and some other uh, speakers have, have mentioned this. And, uh, and uh, I think Matthew O'Toole also asked where uh, you know, the COVID funding that, uh, that the Department of Infrastructure uh, have said that they haven't had. I think uh, Andrew Moore raised it as well. We have, there, there has been I think 1.2 billion of COVID-related funding has come across from Treasury. We have already allocated or identified over 900 million of that, uh, either spent already in terms of the lion's share of it went to business support measures. I think over in around half a billion. Uh, obviously, a significant proportion to health, to communities, to protect the vulnerable people, to education, and some of the interventions that we made there. And we have set aside 95 million for transportation issues. Now, to say that the Department of Infrastructure hasn't got any of that. Uh, isn't strictly accurate because they have already allocated uh, money to support the airports, to support the ferries, to ensure that, they, that that continues. We are waiting on a proposition from them in relation to freight, which I know they are working with the Department of Transport on. And we have also indicated that there will be funds for Translink within that. So, uh, while it, it might be strictly accurate that they haven't got the funding for Translink uh, as we stand, we have set aside money for that, and that's clearly understood by the Department uh, of Infrastructure. And the issue of furloughing Translink workers is a matter for the Infrastructure Minister. What we did was what we were asked to do, which was ask Treasury what the issue was, uh, what the situation was in relation to furloughing public sector workers. And we were given the criteria by which some public sector workers may be furloughed, including some council staff. The decision of whether to go and apply for that is a matter for the Minister involved, or a matter for the Council involved, as to whether they seek to furlough uh, those workers. We were asked to provide uh, the information on that we did. That decision making in relation to that then is down to the individual Minister. Sure. You said to furlough, and you said for the Minister, uh, that for that individual uh, uh, department, would it not be for the executive as a whole? No, I don't think necessarily it would. Uh, no more than if an individual council uh, wanted to furlough certain workers, uh, perhaps uh, workers on the leisure side, that can't be redeployed elsewhere, and that have certainly where the, 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 the council have lost income as a council. That's one of the key factors. You have to have lost income, so that means it would apply to Translink 
uh, where it wouldn't necessarily apply to public sector workers uh, across the board, uh, that the council has lo- or the, uh, the department's lost income. Then it is a matter for each department to consider whether they wish to make a case to Treasury to furlough those workers or not. That's if they decide not to, then of course they manage their budgets accordingly. Uh, so I, I think there are a number, as I say, uh, Paul Given had raised uh, issues in, uh, in relation to what, what is required by the department. He specifically was re- referring, obviously, to the Department for Justice, but I think the points that he made uh, can apply equally. And I, I would say that to all committee chairs and committee members here, uh, that, that it is incumbent on all of us, because I mean, we, we come here to be scrutinised, quite rightly so, by the Assembly. Uh, each minister and each department and each of the committees have a very important role in relation to that, which I uh, absolutely welcome. But we, we have to ensure it, none of us have faced into a situation like this before, where uh, certain departments have had to spend a significant amount of money, but other, other areas where they had planned spend will not happen. Uh, and we need to make sure, uh, in terms of our ability to respond to this, to try and assist in emerging from this, to try and support the economy, the vulnerable in society, the health service, uh, and all of the issues which members have raised, that we ensure that money is properly allocated throughout the course of the rest of the year, and we don't end up in a situation where we have departments sitting on money, uh, and there's some sort of scramble beyond January to try and spend out money. Uh, So I think the committees, uh, as well as the departments, have work to do in that regard. uh, the chair of the Health Committee, Colin Gilnew, raised issues around the uh, new decade, new approach uh, priorities, and, and he's quite correct that there hasn't been sufficient funding provided uh, by the British Government in relation to what was committed under new decade, new approach. The executive have allocated £81 million to the Department of Health for transformation and £5 million for safe staffing. Uh, those commitments were included in the new decade approach, uh, but obviously in light of the impact of COVID-19, the Department had to reallocate some of its transformation allocation to meet other priorities, uh, and obviously uh, the executive would need to look through that and agree uh, to that. Uh, the issue of uh, uh, just the issue of special education needs was mentioned by uh, a number of speakers, uh, both I think Daniel McCrossan and Karen Mullen uh, issued that uh, or mentioned that. And in this budget, we have, uh, and I'm, I'm, I was very pleased that we were able to do that, uh, provide an additional 42 million uh, to have ring fenced for this important issue. And it will go some way. And we're not uh, claiming that it addresses all of the pressures in relation to that, but it certainly goes some way to address existing pressures to meet the needs of children and young people with special educational needs. And a very important step towards addressing those known uh, pressures in relation to all of that. Uh, uh, Paul Frew raised issues in relation to ongoing rate relief. and He he made the remark that the the rates is a a fairly small amount of our our resource, but £1.3 billion in the last financial year, which uh, by anybody's reckoning is a fairly substantial amount. Uh, But we have to... uh, he also argued, I think, in relation to the, the, where he wanted to see a more strategic approach in relation to this budget. And, of course, that's what we want to do. We recognised when we set this out, before we knew the, the depth of what we were in, that this was an unusual uh, and, and, and time-limited approach. This. The objective, clearly, is to get to a multi-annual uh, budget approach, where I, I would think uh, and hope and, and, and certainly prepare and plan for a much more strategic approach over a number of years. I think it allows us to get uh, much more certainty about going forward. I think anyone recognises that we are in in far from ideal times in terms of budget uh, preparation. And I can confirm, yes, the the increase he asked about in relation to uh, the Executive Office budget uh, was in relation to the historical institutional abuse redress uh, allocation. uh, and and that, that's what created that significant increase in relation to their budget. Uh, a number of, of uh, members asked about the idea of how we, we kind of pay our way out of this and, and, and try and uh, secure as much resource as we possibly can uh, and, and raise the issue of borrowing. Uh, the executive can access up to £200 million of borrowing, and this is only be able to, to be able to use in the, the RRI. It's only be able to use for capital uh, expenditure. It would, couldn't be used for resource costs such as grants to business or to help with running costs without the agreement of Treasury. Uh, additionally, it should be remembered it, it does come at a cost, and we have already significant existing borrowing of some £2.5 billion, uh, which has cost £169 million, uh, in terms of repayments in 2020-2021. Uh, so I, I think there, you know, it's, it's always seen as a, a kind of a, a quick 
fix in terms of what we, we might want to spend to try and secure uh, an emergence from what the situation we're in. But people have to remember that we have uh, significant borrowing. There are restrictions in terms of how it can be used. Uh, and there is a significant cost in terms of, of repaying that. And bear in mind that people are arguing, and I know others have argued for you know, capital spend as a way of, of trying to kickstart economic recovery. There is significant capital spend that should have been happening in the first quarter of this year, but it won't happen. And departments do have to look to what they have themselves uh, to try and assist uh, with the priorities of the executive in that regard. Uh, the, uh, I, I think Matthew, Matthew O'Toole also asked about air passenger duty. Uh, it's, they previously made a commitment to the executive made a commitment to eliminate air passenger duty and the 2.3 million budget allocation. Uh, represent the agreed block grant reduction to, devo to devolve the power uh, uh, to, to set APD from 2012, actually. And the cost relates to the duty amount that was payable on devolving the power to set the rate, not the duty on what would be payable in respect of current flights. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the former finance minister who did the last budget here uh, has, has, has given us a very stern lecture about the, the missing years. Can I remind him that we would have had a budget in 2018-19 and 2019-20, had his own party not walked away from a deal uh, that we reached with them, uh, and their, their leadership were quite prepared to accept, but party members scuppered that deal. So uh, while he might claim, he might claim, can I just finish the point, he might allocate four years of missing budgets to us, I can assure him at least two to three of them were responsible of his own party. The Minister for Government Bay might as well get a bit of a discussion going because we're not going to be going too far this evening rather than a Board of Governors meeting right off at 7 o'clock. But uh, it, it doesn't do the Minister well to try and shift the blame. The reality for him and his party is they decided to pull the institutions down. The late Martin McGuinness decided collectively, what maybe not, but whoever it was, decided to pull the institutions down. And would the minister at least accept that in doing so, he created further problems for children with special education needs, further crisis in the health service, further challenge to the unemployed. And as a result of that, he can't therefore in this house tonight try and do a Pontius Pilate and wash his hands and say it was somebody else's. The letter, I have the letter with me, it was Martin McGuinness, the late Martin McGuinness and his party that decided to do the, the job. So don't try and blame the DUP. Well, can, can I say in relation to his own remarks where he, he, he heaped shame across the chamber at the party opposite uh, and exactly did what he's now accusing me of doing, uh, ignored the build up to the inevitable collapse in the executive uh, and the role of his own party and, and senior party members in his own, his own side have acknowledged that there are lessons to be learned. And I think we all will learn lessons in relation to all of that. Uh, but let's not try and, and uh, rewrite history in relation to what caused the issues, what caused the issues, and how long ago they could have been fixed. Uh, and we could have had an executive and a budget, as I say, for 2018-19 and 2019-20 delivered in this House uh, had things turned out differently. Uh, can I also say to him that uh, uh, he does make the points in relation to support for the PSNI, uh, financial support, uh, not just, uh, I don't know, uh, Mr O'Toole uh, corrected him in terms of the, 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 the fact that we actually paid taxes across the Treasury, and that's, that's a, a substantial proportion of the block grant that returns. But I did allocate a £4 million very recently in the last number of weeks uh, for additional support for the PSNI, so uh, I'm sure he would acknowledge that uh, as part of a, a, an allocation. And uh, yes, of course, there was a proposition to increase the number of PSNI offices officers as part of the, the uh, agreement to reform the executive, uh, and I've had some discussions with the Justice Minister, and he will know from his own presence at the Police and Board, you can't simply go out tomorrow and recruit 700 police officers, and that commitment still stands, and I, I'm, I'm sure he will equally uh, reaffirm his own commitment to things like the Irish Language Act uh, to make sure that the, the agreement that we reached is honoured uh, in, all its, in all, its, all its forms. I'll give away again. Here again we are seeing played out in this House is a classic example. If we don't get what we're looking for, you won't get. But the problem is, it's not in the budget. That's the problem. It's on a piece of paper which says we will increase the mem members of the place to 7,500, but no financial commitment. Yet we have a financial commitment in this document of 15 million 
to a medical centre in Londonderry that the business case today doesn't stack up for. And then we're told by the members of the SDLP and Sinn Féin about oh, making sure that everything has to be done properly. And we have to have scrutiny. scrutiny. We, have to, like, we, we can't have any, anything done which is improper. If you don't have a business case which stacks up, why have you allocated £15 million to something which is not financially viable? Like I say, if he had a listen, listen to me, I said I had a discussion with the Justice Minister as part of the budget allocation. Uh, and there's no bid to come forward from Justice, he'll, he'll know, for that additional recruitment. So they, they need time to work that up, to work out how that would, how that would uh, be shaped up and how they would begin. Because I said, you can't simply recruit 700 police officers overnight. Uh, so, there, uh, and that, I have said, there clearly is a commitment uh, to meeting that. What he will know, uh, that will require Justice to come forward with propositions and a uh, bid uh, in relation to supporting that uh, particular area. In relation to the additional £55 million for the, uh, the uh, Futures Fund uh, that we, we announced yesterday, the executive agreed on, yes, yesterday it was, uh, we're all losing track of days here, uh, uh, which was fully supported by the executive. Uh, of course, uh, only a proportion of that is in relation to the, the Graduate Entry Medical School. There are other much needed uh, projects for Derry and for the North West generally, and that is a commitment in principle. Uh, to spend that. Those projects will have to be assessed, they will have to stack up and they will have to pass the, the necessary scrutiny and tests that any uh, expenditure, public expenditure would meet. Uh, so that's, that's clearly going to be the approach there. Uh, but nonetheless, I think it was a very important signal to the North West to, uh, to ensure that the executive was making that commitment again, which was something that we had agreed to in the NDNA document. Uh, Pat Catney raised issues, and I get exactly, I understand his passion in relation to uh, supporting small businesses. Uh, can I say that you know, the, the, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, it, the responsibility in terms of the £25,000 grant is the Department for the Economy, and they have, a, 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 they have an additional £40 million that we set aside to address what they call a business hardship fund, which is intended to target those who have fallen through the gaps of existing uh, small business grant schemes. And, and uh, I know that there was a paper brought forward uh, recently in relation to that, and that's currently going through the uh, processes of executive uh, approval. Uh, and of course, then, as I had said in relation to the rates debate, uh, we have a clear understanding that of the challenges facing the hospitality. Uh, uh, tourism and leisure industries, and in relation to the rates relief package, which we offer to all businesses, including small industrial, uh, and, and again, the, the small industrial got access to the 10k grants uh, as well, which wasn't in the initial package, uh, but we included that rates relief to all businesses here, which wasn't the case in, in the English scheme, uh, that we will have a specific focus on those who we know are going to continue to struggle. Uh, even if restrictions are lifted and businesses can start again, some businesses clearly will not be able to start in the way uh, that they had, they had operated just a, a short number of weeks ago. So uh, we will clearly look to do and to provide all of the support that we possibly can. Uh, sorry, the, uh, some other questions uh, were raised. Uh, can I say that the, uh, the figure uh, is interesting that uh, Mr. Alistair has. has Wax lyrical. Uh, interestingly, my own party leader was criticised for, for making a constitutional point in relation to COVID, uh, and we have a whole range of constitutional points uh, raised from across the floor here uh, in relation to the, the British government and the funding we have received, which I have said I have, I have very much welcomed. Uh, the, uh, he asked a question about the confidence and supply funding, and I have secured confidence and supply funding for 2021, and I expect the remainder to be provided in future years. Uh, he will know, because I have told the House before that the previous Secretary of State informed us that the conference supply money was gone, it was over, it was, we, there was no, nothing more to be got. So I was pleased that we did manage to secure this year's, and uh, as I say, I intend to continue the battle to secure the future years, because uh, not that it was something uh, negotiated by my own party or by the Executive generally, but it was a commitment uh, from the Conservative Party uh, to here uh, for, for a number of years, and we, we want to see that commitment honoured. Uh, thanks, thank you, thanks, Mr. Finkel. I just wanted, wondered if Mr. Allister, he was talking about the block grant, and he, he insisted that annually managed expenditure, i.e., Amy, was in the block grant funding. I just wanted to draw the Minister's attention to a Treasury document, or Her Majesty's Treasury document, as I'm sure Mr. Allister would prefer. It's known, my former employer, 
It's very clear. It's the, the document is called Block Grant and Transparency. It was published in December 2018 and makes clear that departmental expenditure limits, i.e. DEL, is the block grant. AME is outside the block grant. So I just wanted to draw that to the House's attention and Mr Alistair's. Uh, can I thank the member for anticipating my next point? <laughs> I was going to <laughs> quote from a similar document, and that's the statement of funding policy. It says funding from the UK government to the devolved administrations falls into two broad categories: block grant or DEL funding, and funding in relation to annual managed, annually managed expenditure (AMI). This chapter covers the element of the block grant funding that relates to UK government departmental spending within the departmental expenditure limits (DEL). Uh, so, I mean, I hope that clears the matter up for him. Uh, that is uh, a statement of funding policy that has come uh, from, from the British Government itself. Uh, uh, and, uh, of course, the, uh, uh, he, he, he uh, takes me to task over the, the, the description of the fiscal deficit. Three, point, three billion of a fiscal deficit is not an insignificant figure. If somebody is sitting on universal credit at the moment, it is a, a very significant figure. So I have always acknowledged that. But what I have said is that the figure that has been bandied about, about 10, 11, 12 billion. Uh, of, of a deficit being met by the British Government has been inaccurate, and the figures that I provided uh, uh, during the last debate were figures that were worked out by the Department of Finance, not by me on my own. You'd be pleased to know. Uh, a number of uh, people have made points in relation to the multi-annual bu budgets. I've, 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 I've addressed that, and others have, uh, uh, have and, and the, the, the ability of that to give us more certainty and the recognition that we are in far from satisfactory circumstances at the moment. But nonetheless, uh, I have to say that even though it is not satisfactory, I do believe that the executive uh, uh, the ministers, supported by the Assembly, have risen to the challenge, have responded as best as they possibly can, have managed to get a very significant amount of money out on the ground to support not only our health service in terms of uh, fighting this pandemic, but also support our economy and other vulnerable people in society as well through very quick interventions, interventions which would normally, uh, if, if we were operating in normal circumstances, would probably take six months of planning. Uh, of road testing, of consultation, uh, schemes which have been turned around in a number of days uh, or, or maybe weeks have been got out. So uh, I, I do recognise that we are in far from ideal times in terms of scrutiny, but we also then have a duty to respond as quickly as we can to one of the most serious issues I think any of us have ever faced in our lifetime in terms of the public health challenge. Uh, so. I, I also would, would say that clearly uh, several people have mentioned the new decade, new approach, and, and quite clearly we have not got, uh, despite those who have, who have uh, wallowed in the comfort of the, uh, of the support that the British Government has given us, and I welcome that, they certainly have not given us the commitments that they did make under new decade, new approach. And I intend to continue to pursue that with Treasury at every opportunity, uh, because that was a commitment they made to all parties. And just as our political and commitments to various sections of that agreement and deal uh, are held to, and quite rightly held to, uh, so too must the government's commitments uh, to it as well. Uh, last kind of quarter, it is the responsibility of the Finance Minister to bring budget proposals before the House, and it is responsibility that I take seriously, uh, particularly now when our citizens are facing such uncertainty in terms of the future. The Executive's main focus at this time has to be on getting funding where it needs to be to address the COVID-19 issues. And in a world where future economic, social and health landscape is uncertain, it is imperative that we provide the platform that is needed for public services to respond to changing demands. The budget seeks to support key services now and is a platform for the future responsive planning going forward. Uh, last kind of quarter, on that note, I would commend the budget to the Assembly for its approval. Thank you, uh, Minister. Before we proceed to the question, I would remind members that as this is a budget motion, it requires cross-community support. The question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, if any? No. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any? No. Do the members wish to divide the House? All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any? No. Aye. The ayes have it, I think. Okay. I have been advised that the House will divide. Clear the lobbies. The question will be put in three minutes. Order. Members will resume their seats, please.
Before I put the question, I would again remind those members present that, if possible, it would be preferable to avoid a division of the House. The question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, if any? No. Aye. Okay. Do we have tellers? Order, order. <clears throat> tellers have been appointed as follows. The tellers for the eyes are Declan McAleer and Sean Lynch. The tellers for the nose are Rachel Woods and Jerry Carroll. Before the Assembly divides, I want to remind members that as per Standing Order 112, the Assembly currently has proxy voting arrangements in place. Members who have authorised another member to vote on their behalf are not entitled to vote in person and should not enter the voting lobbies. It is important that during any division, social distancing in the Chamber continues to be observed. In order to facilitate this, I would ask members to do the following. Any members in the Chamber who are not due to vote in person should consider leaving the Chamber until the division has concluded. Those members who wish to vote in the lobbies on the opposite side of the Chamber to which they are sitting should leave the Chamber via the nearest door and enter the relevant lobby via the rotunda. Those remaining members who are sitting closest to the lobby doors should enter the lobbies first. Any member who has voted may then wish to leave the Chamber until the division has concluded. I remind members of the need to be patient at all times, to follow the instructions of the lobby clerks and to respect the need for social distancing. Clear the lobbies. The Assembly will divide. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Order. Can members please resume their seats? Members, please resume their seats. We'll wait. Can the clerk read the result? 80 members voted, of which 76 voted aye, 95 per cent. 37 nationalists voted, of which 37 voted aye, 100 per cent. 34 unionists voted, of which 33 voted aye, 97.1 per cent. Nine others voted, of which six voted aye, 66.7 per cent. The motion is carried by cross-community support.